Okay, I think right. I just got us out onto YouTube, so that's good. And what we're was live that? on YouTube. It's always oh, a struggle okay. to get us get Zoom out onto YouTube. Come on, everybody, let's get on YouTube. Dave, I see it there now. Yeah, you know, it, it, it always confuses me. The, um, it's, uh, we, we ended up not being able to send out to YouTube a couple times on the New Jersey Club meetings, and I could never figure out why. And I just figured out why. You, only the host can activate the, uh, the YouTube uh, stream. So uh -huh. even, though, even though I have, I have two machines signed in here uh, as the uh, host account, uh, only the one that I started the meeting from has the button to send out to YouTube. Huh. So uh, I just uh, became less ignorant. So I'm calling this a good day. <laughs> yeah. It is a good day. There's Ray. Hey, all right. That's a very, okay. uh, very dapper attire you have on there. Yeah. Uh, don't turn oh, around. I got a funny feeling. I know what the back looks like. <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> it is like that. I was going <laughs> to figure out a way to like, kind of call it a cheat sheet, you know, dress up halfway up and look, look normal. I said, you know what? I'm just happy to be at this meeting. I'm What's like it? ecstatic over being at it, you know? Apparently everybody dresses halfway up now. The statistics came in from 2020 and the, uh, the sale of uh, business appropriate tops was uh, up dramatically <laughs> and pants did not sell at all last year. Right. <laughs> yep. I believe it. And there are people that go to these Zoom meetings that have half of the waist up and they got just their shorts on. Uh, ridiculous. Yeah. Well, if, if we if we institute a uh, an award for the uh, the the most uh, casual attire, though, you win. I win. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, funny, funny. Uh, I have to make the recovery again. I've made so many in the last couple of months. I can't even count how many times I've been in and out. But they, 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 you know, fixing hearts is kind of like fixing TVs. <laughs> you see something, you burn it out. You change the cap there. And <laughs> I, I told the doctor, I said, "Do you ever work on radios?" <laughs> he says, "No." He says, "Well, you should. You're pretty damn good with them." With everything else, yeah, we had a guy. Fun. We had a guy on the uh, on the Jersey Club meeting the other day. He uh, he had a, he brought a friend to the meeting, and he said, uh, "This is my uh, doctor. He's retired now, but uh, he, uh, he he replaced yeah. a bunch of parts in me over the years, and now I'm teaching him how to replace parts in his radios." <laughs> <laughs> that's a good that's a good thought. I mean, I have one doctor that actually personally calls me. It doesn't have to because I mean he just call me, get his charge in, and walk he's away. But I mean, he's always checking on me, asking me how I am. Yeah. He's trying to hey, I wouldn't go to this doctor. I go to that doctor, you know. He, like today, I kind of like I didn't fire him like yeah. Trump or anything, but I uh, I let I, I let this one guy go, you know, because we walked in a, an appointment. My wife's a registered nurse or was retired now. And uh, we told him about my situation. And uh, it was like it was going in there, one ear out the other. He never checked me, he never did anything. So oh. when we left, my wife said, I was infuriated. I said, I know I can tell you, 100 pounds, but you, you're like a fireball, you know? I said, okay, so you're infuriated. Why? And she goes, you know why? He said, this guy is, is not good. I said, well, Let's get somebody else first. So it just so happened yesterday when I'm in the hospital, or I think it was yesterday or the day before, I met this other fellow and I said, you know what? You know what, my friend? Why don't you... Uh... Thank you. you have money on Yeah. I said, why don't you... Uh... Well, 
Lord. <laughs> well, he, I told him that I want to hire. I want him to be my guy. Well, Ray, you know they they all got a vested interest in keeping you well, so they can send you the bill. Yeah, oh, I know that. I told him why I want to be, because I said I'm looking for a guy that talks to me like you, man to man, doesn't beat around the bush, and and you know like maybe you know like so I you know I like him, you know, <laughs> and he you know he he's a younger guy. I think he's like looks like me, like he comes from India or something. But his English is impeccable. So I, I, I told him, I need you to do this for me. And he says, oh, by the way, he says, the other guy you got, the John Nato, he said he got in a bad car accident. He's out on medical. He'll be out for a long time. I had to laugh. I had to laugh. I, I like a doctor with a, with a sense of humor, Ray. I, I went to see my cardiologist a couple months ago. And uh, he looked at me and he said, I want all my patients to die of something else. <laughs> I like his attitude. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, my guy's like that. My one guy, he's been with me for years, decades. But uh, the other couple guys, I only hit, hit and missed. We have a guy out here in the Buffalo area that's he's the specialist. He's the one, the go-to guy for like veins in the heart. And then they have another guy that does, a, I call it like a shoestring repair. You know, he puts sense in and little things. They all got their specialty, you know? So it is what it is. So it was good talking to you earlier when I sent you that text. I tried to send one to David and said, I'm going to get on this thing early. Oh, good to have you here. We got, we got uh, 14 people checking in on YouTube already. So there'll be a lot more. I hope I can last for a while anyway. That's the other thing that happens when, when you're rusting a lot. You lose a little bit of track. I'm, I'm a real regular guy. I don't even need an alarm clock. But I mean, <laughs> just you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you think you're waking up at 7. <laughs> you're not, you know, and you're not tired, you know. Then you don't want to go to sleep. So there's a couple of days I didn't even sleep. Dave, you look so intensive looking at that screen. <laughs> yeah, got too, too damn many buttons here. Yeah. Sometimes that happens. No, I think we're all set up so we can uh, we can start. You, Steve, you want to wait for more people to show up or you want to? Your, your mic's off. Oh, I'll be all right for a little bit, you know. I've been excited about seeing this Blake's Blake guy's uh, collection and listening to what news you might tell us. And uh, I'm ready when everybody else is ready. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, the, let me make sure. Well, Larry, are you there? There's still people popping in. Maybe we wait another minute or two. Yeah, yeah. let's wait for a bit because I don't. I, I don't, I don't see Larry. see Larry. I don't see Larry yet. You want to maybe yeah. you want to give him a call? Yeah, give him a couple more minutes. He's really there's somebody that's LM. I don't know who that is. Oh, well, that might be him. And he's muted. Yeah. Earth to Larry. <laughs> Hello? Hey, Larry, I just want to make sure I didn't see you on. Um, at the bottom of the screen, somewhere on there, I'm not using a phone, so I don't know, but there's a mute button. 
Okay, turn your video on. There we go. So it's unmuted. Okay. Okay. Uh, say, uh, something. say something. Can you hear me? Yes. I, th I think I heard you. Okay, thanks. Talk, talk to you later. I think we're, we may be hearing him through your phone, Steve. You think so? Larry? Larry? I'm here. Okay. Okay. We're, we're in business then. Um, right. ah, let me, there let me, we go. Let All me right. kick things off here and uh, start the recording. So we can preserve this for posterity. There right? we go. Now I'm in business. Okay, good. Uh, okay. Um, stand by. Just just a second. Hang on. I want to. Yep. I want to start this here. Um, okay, we're good. All right. <clears throat> well, welcome everybody to the uh, January meeting of the Early Television uh, Foundation Society. Um, Glad to see you all. Um, going to um, just say a couple of things about what's happened in the last month, which um, um, is really not a lot. Things have continued to go well at the museum. Um, I'm getting more and more hopeful about being able to uh, plan for a convention this coming fall. Um, we'll play it by ear and see how things go, but. Um, I think that's a possibility, and it would really be really be nice to to uh, to do that if it's uh, if it's safe. Um, we have we just passed um, 120 members for um, 2021, and that's ahead of where we were last year. Usually, we get people dribble in during the year. Uh, we had a total of uh, I think 186 last year by the end of the year. So if you haven't joined yet or renewed your membership, please do that. Uh, it's 35 bucks and you can do it on the side panel, left side panel of any page of our website, um, the, but, the box that says support the museum. Um, I'm gonna start the, the um, uh, presentation tonight with, um, as we're gonna do each month and talking about um, uh, something, an interesting item at the museum. And this um, month, we're going to talk about the our CBS field sequential Varicolor camera. Um, Larry, are you set up so you can, so we can see your video? Yes, yes I am. Okay. Oh, perfect. Hey, this is fancy. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, that looks great. Um, let me tell you, uh, just go over, I, I know most of you already know this story, but I'm going to spend a couple of minutes going over a brief history of the CBS color system. Um, the first color system was actually, that we know of, was, was done by uh, John Logie Baird back in 1928. And it was also a field sequential system and, and, and used a mechanical scanning uh, disk too. And before World War II, um, really uh, about the, si at the same time as, um, as uh, iconoscope cameras were being developed, uh, CBS and RCA and others experimented with color, again, field sequential. Um, and uh, then after the war, um, CBS worked through the war on their system, perfecting their system and made a real pitch to the FCC to say, um, hey, let's adopt a color system before black and white has many sets sold. Uh, and they did this because their system was, um, uh, wasn't compatible with, the, with, uh, with black and white television. Um, and um, finally in 1950, the FCC did a, a comparison of where RCA was with their compatible system and CBS's system. And it was like night and day, the CBS system produced really, really good pictures. The RCA system was early in its development and didn't produce very good pictures. So um, the FCC authorized the, um, um, the um, CBS to um, implement their system. Um, Larry, um, just, 
let's go to um, number one, just the, so that I make sure all of you know how the receivers in, in, in field sequential systems work. They have a, a rotating color wheel that, um, scan, that goes in front of the camera, in front of the screen. There's a similar one in front of the camera and they're synchronized. So um, the three primary colors are transmitted one um, uh, sequentially and the, thus the name field sequential. Um, the um, CBS system um, was, um, oh, let's, let's pan over to the, gray, to the gray monitor, Larry, so we can show what uh, one of the pieces of equipment we have for, um, for viewing field sequential color. And you can see the wheel inside and has a magnifier in it. That's a 10 inch CRT. We got that long before we got the camera. Um, one of the conditions of the CBS um, uh, field sequential uh, system that the FCC made was that they had to find companies to manufacture their sets. Uh, they were unsuccessful because RCA was making great progress at that time. Um, and uh, people could see the writing on the wall that it was going to be um, that eventually RCA was most likely going to have a compatible system that worked. And so CBS was unable to get um, uh, any support for manufacturers for making their sets. A few were made, and there are a few, a few for surviving sets around. Um, the, um, and then the Korean War came, around, came along, and the government declared that the motors used in the fuel sequential sets for the wheels uh, were needed for the manufacturing capacity for motors were needed for the war effort. And that's just what CBS needed. In fact, there's some speculation that CBS might have uh, push that along, uh, and that allowed them to uh, bow out of, of their system. Larry, pan over to the uh, RCA um, uh, prototype set. This is a 1952 um, set from RCA um, that uh, Nick Williams has loaned to the museum, and we restored it a few years ago. Um, it um, um, uh, used, uh, didn't use the, the system that they ended up with, but it was sort of- Hi, Chuck Azar here, just got here. Of an interim step along the way to, um, to their, the set that was finally adopted as the, NT, the system is finally adopted by, by the country as the NTSC color system. Okay, let's go back to the camera now. Um, in 2015, um, a, um, uh, an anonymous source donated this camera to the museum, or just the camera head. Um, now inside it, um, mounted horizontally is a 5820 image orthicon tube. Um, and then right behind the lens is a small um, color wheel. So let's go to that. That's number, what is that? There you go, the color, the color drum uh, that is behind the lens. And inside that drum was a mirror that directed the image through the lens to the face of the um, of the um, of the image orthicon too. Now, as I say, all we had was the um, was the camera head, and um, we made the decision to try to get it going. We had very good documentation from CBS on on what they used, uh, which of course was all vacuum tube, and that didn't seem like a practical approach. So what we decided to do, let's go back to the camera again, Larry, to number, uh, number three. Um, we, uh, we, we, we had to make a um, makeshift um, mount for the camera and you can see it on the bottom and also a, a cable because it's not a standard that even though the shell looks like the ones used on, on, um, um, on RCA cameras, it's not, it's different. So we had to make a connector and, a and you, we used an old cable that we had that had an, the number of uh, uh, leads in it that we need. Um, I should say inside the, go back to the camera head again. Inside the camera head, all there is is um, the, some voltage dividers, a video preamp and a, um, um, 
and a high voltage power supply that generates, I think, 1500 volts for the, um, uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You can go down there now. A high voltage power supply that was used uh, to, 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 to drive the uh, image orthicon. We were able to get all that work working and made the decision to use vacuum tubes for the sweep circuits because of the, it was, it was a much easier way. Yeah, you know, stay down on that unit at the bottom, Larry. Um, the, um, it was easier to match the tubes to the deflection yoke uh, in the image orthicon. So we used the, the um, uh, vacuum tube circuits using CBS documentations to build, to build all, the, um, uh, all the deflection circuitry. And then go up the, to the next one. We built a CCU uh, and it contains the, you know, the various pots for setting the voltages in the, um, in the um, image orthicon, for the image orthicon and uh, also has in it the circuitry for driving the motor and synchronizing it. And you can see that's all solid state. Um, now we needed a sink generator um, for this. And fortunately, a couple of years earlier, I built a color bar generator uh, for the field sequential system. That was the first time we were able to get pictures on the, um, uh, on the field sequential sets. And I used it as the sink generator. Um, then I also built another unit, which is the one above it, which is a video processor. And in it are, um, the um, uh, of another video preamplifier, and again, it's all solid state, um, and uh, a gamma corrector, and various circuitry for switching the uh, the um, uh, the three colors to go into the video feed, and also circuitry for inserting blank uh, blanking and and sync. Now we had to go, and so going up to the next um, thing up above it, we had to take, we had, for a waveform monitor, we used a, um, um, a tectronic unit we had around and had to modify it for the, uh, the 405 line system, which has a different, um, quite a bit higher um, line rate and uh, um, somewhat lower uh, frame rate. So we had to modify it. And that's what we used for setting it up. Now, and when we have our um, um, conventions, we've had them in the past, we de we've demonstrated this, and it produces a decent picture. Um, I think if we took the time, there's the lights we put up and put for it, and um, um, then we have a color bar pattern that we had printed for setup purposes, and then um, we had people standing in front of it, and we can tell we could televise it. I think if we if we ever spent the time setting up and having somebody who really knew how to set up an image orthicon, we could get way better pictures than we have. But it's just sort of thrilling to see any kind of pictures out of something this uh, uh, this old. So that's um, that's my little description. Does anybody have any questions? Steve. Uh <laughs> Steve, I was wondering about the weird, wild shape of the of the color disc. Instead of a pie shaped, it's all those angles and so on. I don't understand why. On the on the on the color wheel. On the wheel. Yeah. Um, well, that's because it um, it it's not big enough. The segment is not big enough to completely cover the CRT, and so. It's designed so that as it moves down the CRT, starting in the scanning lines on the top, the filter stays over the face of the tube at the point where the scanning lines are, if I'm making any sense. So that's why it's, uh, that's why it's made that. And that allows them to make the wheel uh, substantially smaller. Steve? Steve, uh, yeah. I, I've got a question that has bothered me for a while. Uh, in a bunch of literature that I found, which is Dumont literature, they show in 1949, I think it is, a uh, field sequential color system, which they called industrial color system, uses a wheel, but it's 525 lines, 30 right. frames. 
And I'm wondering, other than bandwidth, why CBS didn't try to do that. It seems uh, like it would work. I think the bandwidth is the reason we have that we have a Dumont monitor um, for that for that uh, uh, for that that standard, and it's it's um, if I remember correctly, it requires 18 megahertz of bandwidth to get decent resolution. So that's why CBS, you know, used what they did. I, I suppose that would do it. That's what three TV channels or something. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. They already had a problem with their incompatibility, and that's the last thing yeah. they had. I was just thinking that at 525 lines, you know, 30 frames, it ought to at least be able to pick up, be picked up on a black and white TV, but uh, maybe yeah. not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, Steve? Yeah. Uh, one thing I was wondering about is, it, whoa, I should have shaved. <laughs> uh, in thinking about it, wasn't the CBS system a uh, 72 frame per second, uh, 144 field system? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So was it due to faster frame rate? Well, it's actually a faster frame rate, but it's slower per color. The field rate is, is you know, is... is is 24 versus 30. Okay, for the color, it was 24 uh, yeah. frames yeah. Uh, instead of 72. Yeah. Okay, cool. I understand what you're saying now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, when we open up the museum um, for our convention, I hope you all will come and, uh, and we'll fire it up. And you can see yourselves on feel sequential TV. You know, the um, um, at the World's Fair, RCA gave out cards that say it were, you, could, you could go and be televised in 1939 and on a pavilion there. And they gave out cards saying, you have been televised by the RCA television system. Well, we made replica cards that say you've been televised by field sequential color that we give out to people. So see you next convention. <laughs> Steve, can you hear me? I think we're ready to move on to um, Blake's presentation then. Mike Molnar had a question, I think. Yeah, can you hear me? Well, hi, this is Chuck Azar. I'm in now. Hey, Steve? Yeah. Uh, my question was, what didn't CBS originally plan to uh, do this color broadcasting up in UHF somewhere to, to use the full bandwidth? And then <laughs> yeah, that was one of the one of the one of their suggestions. Now they what they actually did broadcast, they broadcast on, as I understand it, 10 stations around the country, including the one in Columbus. Um, that that monitor we have came from Atlanta. Um, so, but I remember at one point in the development, they did talk about using, using, a, using UHF channels. Okay, thanks. There used to be a guy in Connecticut named Al Denson who had something called Denson Electronics. And back when I was in high school, I used to go visit him a few times. And he had a bunch of CBS color stuff in his warehouse, and I've always wondered what happened to it. Uh, probably in a landfill, unfortunately, but it was uh, probably pretty yeah. bizarre stuff. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be nice to to find a bunch of that stuff. It really would. So are we going to Blake next, or are we going to um, Can you hear me? Um, Mike? Charles Azar is trying to talk. Right. I just wanted to say I've joined. Can you see me? Yeah, we can hear you now, too. OK, great. OK, fine. And happy birthday, Chuck. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Had a good birthday. I flew in Joe Stone Crabs from Miami Beach. <laughs> Ooh. Happy birthday, Chuck. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday, Chuck. Thanks.
Well, there's a lot of people. How many are on right now? Um, 67 on Zoom and um, 36, I think, on, uh, on YouTube. Okay, who are we going to next? I will go to Blake next. Oh no, we were going to. Um, we had the um, the question, uh, the the, uh, the tech topic. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, I forgot entirely about that. Um, I was going to say I was waiting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, the tech tech topic. Um, was, um, there, it was a little confusing. There was a question asked about, um, was the CT100 the only set that took, that was able to produce um, really accurate colors? And, and, and most of the answers at that time were related to the phosphors in the 15G and in the 21AX. But there's also the issue of the circuitry that was used in the CT100. So, um, both topic. Let's talk about both topics. So anyone that has anything to chime in, let's uh, uh, let's hear from you. If I could be allowed to share the screen, alternate the cloth, um, the, cloth, the cloth video projector used INQ. The I NTSC, believe you can, David, yes. The NTSC signal specification at the table below shows the uh, I and Q bandwidth, where the Q channel is basically half a megahertz and the I channel is much wider, 1.3 it says here, 2 dB down. Uh, this gave original NTSC greater resolution in the red colors and the CT100 had the circuitry to do this. It had two separate bandpass amplifiers for color and two separate delay lines to get it all lined up on the screen. I don't know if any other set had that. And I think that's one of the interesting questions. Is there any other set that had separate the, INQ? The Gloss video beam projector had INQ. But that's just the angles. Um, did it have the separate bandwidth? Yes, that's, because the CLOS, the CLOS was much newer, very recent, relatively speaking. And uh, by then, broadcasters had gone over to Equiband and weren't transmitting the wide I anymore. I see. Are you saying that the broadcasters stopped broadcasting I at a certain time? I never knew that. It just, the newer equipment just didn't have the bandwidth. They left it out. So does anyone know about any other early sets that had wideband I? You know, I don't know specifically, but you would think that as many 15G base sets as there were in 1954, that some of them must have had it, uh, but I just don't know. Um, we'd have to go back and research the circuits of, um, of the various sets that were made then. Well, if they had I and Q, there'd be no reason not to have the wideband amplifiers, because that was the trickiest part for the phase shift angles. Uh, RCA in their uh, solid state uh, sets in the 70s for a brief time had IQ uh, demodulation uh, with wideband I, but uh, I uh, studied it very 
carefully when I was working at Zenith because Zenith wanted to know whether it was worth it. And it turns out by that time uh, with the IF amplifier designs that were in use and the steep uh, sound, <clears throat> sound traps, the phase distortion uh, was just terrible. And, uh, and the RCA sets, although they nom nominally had wideband I, they actually reduced the response greatly because otherwise the uh, edges of red objects would all have rainbows on them. So, uh, <laughs> that only lasted for maybe one or two years models and it went back to uh, equal band. I have, this is Jim Manning. I have a separate question. My understanding was that the phosphors were actually different and they were more accurate on the early sets. The later, the later sets had brighter phosphors, but the colors weren't as good like the red. Yeah, they, that's uh, true. There uh, is one uh, technical paper from RCA in uh, the, uh, the 60s that uh, goes from the 15 GP22 up to the Venidate rare earth phosphor. And it covers the general variations that have been used. And there were about 12 different major phosphor formulations used over the years. Uh, most of them, uh, variations in red, uh, a couple of variations in green, and two different uh, blue phosphors. And uh, the interesting thing is that the 15GP22 uh, used a blue phosphor that uh, uh, while it was close to NTSC, it was actually a little bit on the green side. And the later tubes used a sulfide blue phosphor that was more towards violet. But they wanted to use sulfide phosphors to start with, but they had a problem with copper contamination in the 15G. And the copper contamination would change the blue phosphor to green. So they, they had to use something different. Uh, but even with those 12 variations uh, of the different phosphors, that only tells the rough story. There were uh, minor changes to the formulations over the years that aren't documented. And in fact, there's, there's one paper that says that the uh, red phosphor that was nominally the same in the 15G and the 21AX was actually reformulated. It was the same color, but uh, much brighter and more efficient in the 21AX. Um, in terms of the color range that the tubes could produce, the 15G used a P1 green. And the really big change uh, in, in uh, subsequent years was to go to a sulfide green phosphor, which is uh, not as pure green, it's more yellow. And, uh, and, and there were variations uh, in the green 
uh, especially when um, some manufacturers added cadmium, which made the green more efficient, but still more yellow. Uh, eventually, because of the toxic nature of cadmium, it was dropped and, uh, and the manufacturers went back to a uh, zinc sulfide uh, phosphor, which is yellower than NTFC, but they kind of standardized on it. And that's the color that eventually became standard for PAL and also for high definition television. And uh, meanwhile, uh, the NTSC cameras were still uh, manufactured for NTSC specs. So the American TV manufacturers were doing whatever they liked to modify the signal processing to partially compensate for the yellower green phosphor. Uh, Pal got it right because they compensated in the camera instead of the receivers. And HDTV did the same thing. And, uh, and then the computer industry picked up the same specifications and uh, for digital still cameras, they call it sRGB. So all these systems today are singing from the same sheet of music, but NTSC for many decades was kind of the wild west. Does anybody know the 19 inch color tube that uh, the 19 VP that Motorola and CBS used early, what, what those phosphors were? Uh, no, I don't, but I suspect that uh, they were similar to the 21AX to start with. And then in the early 60s, the all sulfide phosphors were developed in which the red it was a zinc cadmium sulfide. And uh, that had two effects. One is that the screen color became that uh, olive green that you see on some of the old tubes. And also, that sulfide red phosphor uh, was nonlinear and tended to turn orange in the uh, bright highlights. But um, the, uh, all the other red phosphors that have been used have been pretty close to NTSC red. It was really the green phosphor that varied the worst. Uh, and the blue somewhat. Um, in fact, while I was at Zenith, um, the phosphor lab uh, decided to look at a, uh, a blue phosphor that was more cyan than purple uh, in order to balance out the beam currents somewhat. And um, they asked me to uh, look at uh, a trial tube and uh, set up the circuits in a set to match the uh, change. And uh, of course, what happened, which you might not think of at first, but once you think of it, it's obvious. You change the blue, and you also change the complementary color, the yellow, in the opposite direction to compensate. So when you change one phosphor, you also change the complementary color. And in the case of the uh, early change in the green phosphor, it didn't matter because there's no common object that's magenta. So if the 
magentas come out a little more purple or a little more red, nobody would care. But if you move colors near yellow, you change the skin tones and that just wouldn't fly. Hey, Wayne, uh, if, if I understand this correctly, and, and I very well may not, because I'm no engineer, the we all of these different formulations were just one compromise or another. Uh, from the charts that I've seen, no color gamut of any color CRT came anywhere close to covering the full color gamut that the human eye can see. Would that, would that be correct? Uh, yes, that's correct, because it's a basic... Uh, issue of uh, the color of light sources and the, and the mixtures they can give. And it's because of the responses of the cells in the eye are not pure, they're very wide band. And therefore, the phosphor that gives a good saturated range of red to orange to yellow to green is going to be a yellowish green and is going to result in cyan colors being less than 100% saturated. So even if you get a laser display that has very wide color range, it's generally going to be missing some of the possibility in the cyan region. Uh, this is not a, a difficulty in terms of practical use because it, this characteristic of the eye also means that you can't make paints and inks that are cyan and very saturated. The only way to get those blue-green colors is with a laser or with a very uh, dense piece of uh, stained glass and a bright light behind it. Cam camera manufacturers were forever playing a game of catch-up with the tube manufacturers. Yeah, this uh, situation was like the old joke about the uh, guy in the clock tower setting the clock by when the train arrives and the uh, train conductor setting his watch about when the bell rings in the clock tower. <laughs> the camera manufacturer's main uh, aim was to make pictures that looked good on professional monitors. And the secondary aim was to make good pictures on home TVs because who could tell what the TV manufacturers would do next year? <laughs> Are there any more um, comments? I have one comment. Maybe uh, Wayne could comment on it, but I heard uh, eons ago that uh, when Sony just, to, uh, I don't know what the variation on the phosphors is that once the manufacturer decided on using a particular one, how much variation there was from, you can tell us whether this sounds plausible, uh, that when Sony was making the Trinitron monitors for electronics, who I guess create a batch of phosphor of red, blue, and green, they would check the phosphor color and put it on the shelf when they got one that hit the right uh, color. And they would wait until they had a set of red, blue, green phosphor that was the correct red, blue, and green uh, because their normal batches weren't that close. Is that plausible? Uh, very plausible. In fact, um, the uh, 
Simti C phosphors. You know, they had uh, uh, several different proposed exact phosphor colors for Simti standards. And A eventually settled on Simti C. Well, the C stood for Conrack because Conrack was using custom made tubes that uh, may have been manufactured by RCA, but, but were manufactured with a uh, selected uh, set of barrels of phosphor material. And they did not run with the TV uh, regular production. They, they had those uh, barrels stashed away and those were used for the contract monitors. Um, thank you. This has very been, been fascinating. Um, um, why don't we move on now to our presentations? Um, and I'm still confused as to who's going first. Are we going to have, because I know that um, um, Mike had wanted to start. Yeah, we're going to, what we're are we going to take do? Blake. Blake's Blake. going to go now. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. You're up, Blake. All right. I'm just getting myself off mute. Good evening, gentlemen. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Blake Hinkle. I'm 28. I live in Ashtabula, Ohio. I started collecting uh, two year, about a little over two, two years ago in November of 2018. Um, I mentioned that just because I think I've gotten a lot of, a lot of comments that my collection is pretty vast given the short amount of time that I've uh, kind of specialized. But at any rate, um, I got with Dave earlier uh, this week and uh, I, I did a, a video, kind of a research, a video essay on the history of Predicta that I found um, that a lot of people have found to be super uh, informative. And I figured it would be something neat to start the video off with. It's only a little less than five minutes long. I did it a little less than a year ago. It's got a lot of stock footage from Philco stuff I found online. Um, and I think from there, that would be a, a good place to start. And then we could get the full tour. So uh, without further ado, do you have that ready, Dave? Dave, you're on mute. We can't hear you. Uh, why don't you start and come back to the video because it is not cooperating. We got nailed by technology again here. Okay. One second. Just trying to figure out there we go i was hoping to have a nice slick introduction after that video dave whether this tv would already be running with the demo but yep so. and you <laughs> got uh you got let down um it's all right you know, let me let me try to run it from uh, hang on let me let me see if i can uh if i can run it from youtube Nah, it's it's going to take me too long. I'm sorry. So go, go give it a start, and then I'll uh, I'll jump in if I when I got it ready ready for you, and you can take it when you uh, whenever you want. No problem. So um, what kind of brought well, me what you've done? Rabbit hole? You're giving me a a actual list. You give me a picture of the diagram, so you so you actually created more work for me. So it takes a little bit longer. Um, I uh, at any rate, I uh, I, I actually st I so I started collecting. Uh, I, I, I went down like a predictor rabbit hole um, in that November night in 2018. Uh, my grandmother had a, a predict a very particular predictor set um, that I remembered very vividly as a child that I have in my collection that I'm not going to spoil by giving away the name. Um, at any rate, it kind of started me down a rabbit hole where I kind of spiraled and um, now we're here. At any rate, uh, this is the 1959. My, my collection is, fo is focused on Philco's introductory predictor line from 1959 introduced during the Miss America pageant 
of 1959 in uh, November of 1958. Uh, this is a 1959 Philco Predicta uh, Baby Grand. It is the only set they sold, only a 24 inch CRT model. Um, this set is fully restored. I came across it on Facebook Marketplace for $100. Um, it's really beat physically. That's why it's got a kind of a stilt job with the books. I got to do some gluing so those legs don't come off. Um, it is fully restored. The, uh, one of my uh, awesome Predicta uh, friends named Jason Neal in Philadelphia did the restoration for me. Um, and uh, he knocked it out of the park. The, uh, the front speaker got damaged in transit, unfortunately, before I got it. So I, um, I have the sound off. But as you can see, the picture comes on i'm broadcasting a channel five bubble in my little showcase tonight so every tv will be on channel five for licensing purposes i probably won't show any sound just so we don't lose anything um, with youtube or anything but yeah so this set works great aside from the leading a new speaker um fully restored uh running a 9060 chassis a lot of these predict the oddballs, as I call them, ones that aren't the more popular floating CRT head equivalents. Um, they run the 9L60 chassis just because of the way that it's spaced out in the back. It's just like a single piece chassis. Um, it's kind of a dog. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, this is the blonde one. And as you can see, it works great. So I'm going to turn it off. All right. I have it's your funny. video. I, I have I've your got video one of those. And it's when you want. got the same problem. Delay. So you actually created more work for me. So, so it takes a little, say I, take a little bit. I have your video Please put yourself ready, Blake, if you want it. Yeah, if if um if 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 ever if if I could remind everybody to get themselves on mute, please. And if Dave, if you could go ahead with that video, that'd be awesome. Okay. So you actually created more work for me. The TV industry was not in good health in the Let's say the country was going to have a presentation. Please put yourself on the lake if you want it. Yeah, if 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 ever remind everybody to get themselves on mute, please. And if David, be awesome. RCA was paying the history. So you actually created more. Predicted to. Season of David. The history of predicted. So you actually created more. The TV in 57, the country was going into a mild recession and the TV market was saturated. 75% of all households had a television set. Predicted Philco two. was not in good shape when the predicted came in. RCA was pushing color sets and dominating, while Zenith was pushing the reliability of hand-wired sets. Philco mm -hmm. had to do something to carve its difference. to combat the, the color unit. frenzy, Phil on design the and monochrome was going technological into a mild advances. recession. Philco the TV would do as it had done before and allow its R&D department to show the way to the concepts set. of the future. The Predicta the was the chassis was not in good shape console and tabletop sets. Occupying RCA was pushing space, color sets and dominant view, while the Zenith was pushing the reliability of hand-wired sets. Philco mm -hmm. had to do some proper the credit. Credit. If We must mention the team responsible for the design revolution. Osweiler joined Philco as a manager of industrial design for consumer electronics. He had studied at Chicago School of Art before serving as a captain in World War II. Gosweiler was very excited at the prospect of the Predicta. The... What do you think? Will it sell? Alan was so concerned with the rap and changed the subject. Predicta was announced on June 2nd. Design hallmarks included a 21 inch semi flat picture tube, a separate CRT from chassis, smallest and lightest chassis of the time, 
It was announced to the public during the 1959 Miss America pageant. I would like to be one of the first people to present to you your gift from our host, the Philco Corporation. Your television set named in your honor, the Philco Miss America. It's lovely. The 1958 Miss America pageant has been brought to you by Philco Corporation, creators of Predicta, America's newest and most advanced television. See it at your Philco dealer. Well, do you have any guesses as to who she might be? Now, I'll give you a big clue. She's lovely. And here's the lovely TV set named in her honor. Miss America. At first, Predicta seemed to be a great success for Philco. The stock prices rose strongly. The Consumer Bulletin claimed, it appears to be a useful approach to the long-awaited flat wall type TV. Philco seemed to pour money into the R&D of these sets, getting the CRT as thin as possible and using a new plastic composite to house the CRT. Philco was also obsessed with saving actual space and weight with the components of the TV and was pioneering the use of printed circuits in these sets. The radical shrink of main essential hardware contributed greatly to the excessive heat the predictor were known for. Unfortunately, things soured quickly shortly after this bit of good press for Philco. Consumer Reports criticized the tandem, citing Philco's picture tube, calling it somewhat lacking in crispness or detail, furthermore calling the price much too high, and saying the CRT is still 35 pounds and heavier than most portables. Philco dealers at the time ultimately cited the unreliability as the death of the set. Many were told to keep as many replacement CRTs as possible and stored many extra chassis boards to swap out. The tube reportedly lasted six months, and dealers were reported to have made much more in warranty pay from Philco than any sales of the actual sets. After this news spread and the design novelty wore off, the public quickly soured on the Philco Predicta. Unfortunately, the Predicta now resides in the dustbin of history. But let us not forget the interesting things it brought forward, if nothing more than a great case study on applying a standard formula, form follows function. I'd like to give a special thank you to the Antique Wireless Association in the Old Timers Bulletin May 1994 edition, Philco 1958, an era of unique TV designs by John Oklowitz, giving me my primary information source. The history of Predicta. The TV industry. All right, guys. So as you can see, I kind of went down the Predicta history rabbit hole when I uh, got deep into it. <laughs> um, a lot of that footage came off of, um, there's a DVD on eBay that is a bunch of Philco uh, related uh, like advertisements and commercials. And that's primarily where I got a lot of that stock footage. Um, at any rate, um, we're going to get back onto the tour here. Um, this set probably is familiar to a lot of you. It's one of the more common ones. This is the, uh, the uh, Philco 17 or 3. Um, I was specifically looking for this set in this color just because I have a later advertisement you'll see that is in full color and it showed this one uh, announcing the predict the line. So it's really pretty. Um, I've got a UHF tuner assembly ready to go for it, but I thought this shaft was shorter than it was. So I got to switch it out. And this is like a mouse maze. So I'm not even messing with that right now. <laughs> um, as we move along, I have a, uh, this is my, uh, one of my barber poles. This is my mahogany version. In my mahogany barber pole, I have UHF tuner on it. Um, one of the more common predictors, you see them on eBay, you see them on Facebook marketplace. Fortunately for me, this one's not missing any knobs. It's really clean. Um, I got it from a, a private collector in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, with this set, I also got the one next to it. This one's a little bit more interesting. Um, this is a Philco Predicta tandem stereophonic model. You don't see a lot of these, especially super clean. Um, this, this came from a collector in Cleveland. He, he got it from the original owner. Um, it, it, it's immaculate. It, it, uh, the nice thing about this is that, um, it, as you can see directly to the left of it, there's a record player. Um, it, it is also, that was, uh, it was sold alongside the Predicta line. It is a G series. 
What's neat about all their audio stuff and with the Philco Tandem Stereophonic series, um, it utilizes the audio channels. I'm not super educated on the specifics of like how electronically it's done, but there's like a, a an audio like AV jack on the back that looks pretty universal to all the Philco audio of that area that you can string. Um, and I would imagine that they would use the amplifiers and what have you, and um, it would give you a pretty rock solid sound. Um, I do not have any of these restored. Um, these ones are in the area of going to be restored with this one probably next up on the list. Um, and as you can see as well too, I've got a lot of neat uh, Philco air period correct uh, clocks, radios that they sold alongside um, their uh, predict the line that year. So uh, we're gonna go ahead now into the main predictor room. This is where the, the goodies are. Um, I'm gonna start with the advertisement that I have that will kind of give us a good intro on everything in here. Um, this is a full color dealer advertisement. This was sent internally from Philco to their dealers um, announcing the predict line in full color. As you can see, like I said, that 17 is also featured. Um, it's got a lot of really neat sets. A couple of them you may not have seen before. Um, and I'm fortunate to have almost all of them in my lineup today. Um, we'll go down and continue. This is a, a, a 21 inch holiday. The holiday and the barber pole models were announced alongside the 1959 predictors as they're like, I guess they're lead ins. The reason you don't see the um, holiday or the predict on this specific advertisement is because it was actually like full page on the other side. Um, I just found the other odd models a little bit more interesting because you never see anything on them. So you can see the tandem's got its own corner there as well. Um, but at any rate, this blonde is super clean. I mean, you never find blondes with that kind of like a, a finish, no, no smoky nicotine haze. Um, and the chrome and, or the, the uh, brass is all super clean. Um, right next to it as well, you'll see I've got my mahogany holiday. Um, this one has a UHF tuner. Um, again, has the original piece is relatively clean, especially for what you can find. Um, what's really neat is underneath. So Philco alongside the predict the line had like a deluxe, I guess you'd call it chassis line. Um, and this was actually, this is a G series Philco that was a one of their deluxe series uh, sold alongside the predictas in 1959 in blonde. Um, and it's, it's super clean. I got it in Cleveland, Ohio from a gentleman. Um, he got it. It was his father's. So it was from the original owner, I guess you'd say was son. Um, and that set is advertised right here. So it's kind of cool. Um, as we make our way over, this little beautiful blonde barber pole um, is fully restored. However, like any good predicta, um, you're gonna see that not, even though I have a lot of them functioning, um, like a predicta, some of them are still gonna lay an egg every once in a while. And this one came back to me immaculate, was working great. And then it started a little bit of a vertical roll. So. Like anything, you kind of roll with it and it'll get worked on. But we're gonna make our way over here to the, the first little kind of wing, I guess I would say. This is the uh, the Predicta full dress wing. Um, the blonde full dress over here is the set that my grandmother had that really got me into collecting or I guess got me into Predictas. I remember that name and that style. Um, the first Predicta I actually had was a Siesta that I don't even actually have just cause I got really into the 59 line when I did my research and what have you. Um, the, the full dresses are really hard to find that that's kind of why I started with the 1960 siesta set was just because to find one of these sets, you really had to look long and hard. Um, this one I got from a, a fellow collector, a real good friend of mine named Jerry Traub out of California. Um, he got it restored by a technician of his in San Francisco. Um, I'm going to get in front of the camera now as I'm talking and I'll start kind of powering these up to show you. Um, these have all kind of been restored by different technicians, um, but they all work really well. Uh, these sets all use the 9L60 chassis, which again is um, that bear of a chassis that I kind of mentioned. Um, Dan Jones did work a lot of the, the Predicta Master in Detroit, did a lot of the work on um, these two sets here. He did, did it on these two, restored these two for me. Um, they work really well as well. Um, I'm going to get this powered up. Get it. Oh, touch another. We don't have it plugged in. Oh, it helped if it was plugged in. Sorry about that, guys. Dan, are, are you on the call? Do you have anything you want to mention about how awesome the 9L60 was to restore for predict compared to other normal predictors? I know a lot of these guys have probably tackled normal predictors. 
Well, it, I don't know how you'd call it awesome. Um, it has a lot of the same issues that the other styles of predictors have, but the weird thing about it is it's a very long, like rectangular chassis and it's kind of three dimensional. You've got pieces on the top. You've got on the, on the left-hand side of the top is your IF strip. The right-hand side is the deflection board. On the back, you've got the 5U4 rectifier. They didn't use this, the uh, germanium diodes in this one. Um, power transformers on the opposite end. So at least the 5U4 is not cooking the transformer. Um, you also have a lot of point-to-point -point wiring on the back. And then on the front, you have the flyback box. And then to the left of that, you've got the video and sound boards and the synchronization. Dan, your mic went off. Yeah, it said the host muted me, so oh, I guess I rambled right. on too long. No, I think so. <laughs> you got, you got but at least plug. inside those larger sets, there was some room to spread things out, so the heating problems weren't quite as bad as inside the actual quote-unquote predictors and like the pedestals and barber poles. Yeah, I agree with that. I would only say that I've only, I mean, the only, the only comment I would have is, is that the 9L60 chassis is the only chassis that I've personally had the most kind of on off issues with. So, I mean, take that for what it's worth. I, it's also seemed to be the most hardest survived. Um, again, my, my, also my uh, sample pool for that survey is highly limited. So I, I take that for what it's worth, but I mean, it seemed like these sets, all predictors in general, ran really hot. And from some of the, I, I spoke to a, a, a gentleman that had, had done some research um, on this stuff. And then I also spoke to the gentleman that I, I took some of my research off of from an article that talked to a lot of initial predictor engineers. And um, heat was the number one killer of these things. The CRTs actually survived a lot better than most people think. Heat was really the problem. But um at any rate, uh, as you can see, these all are working real great. Um, one of the neat features on the bottom is it's got three speaker wraparound sound. Philco was really toying around with the different sound ideas in the TV too. A lot of the TVs have different sound gimmicks. Um, on top of the or the so I'll, I'll spotlight the middle one. The middle one is a 1959 Philco predict a slant back or tabletop full dress. Um, I've only ever seen one other. Well, that's actually not true. It's always funny when you, you find us, you look for a set, you never see it for two or three years and then you find one and then a couple come out the woodwork a week later. So there has been a couple that came out the woodwork shortly after I found it, found this one, but um, you, you never find these type of oddball predictors, especially the full dress series. The biggest thing with these sets is that around the back, um, there's this CRT, uh, there's like a CRT cover that's like this plastic composite. Um, and it, it, it really, uh, it's really, really fragile. Most of the time when you find these, they're broken. I'm very fortunate that all of mine in my collection are intact, but I know several collectors that have full dresses that have their CRT covers completely shattered. Um, and then as you can see up here, I was able to score one of the uh, full dress radios that were advertised along the full dress TVs during the 1959 model year. Thank you very much, Dan, for the uh, insight on the chassis. Yep. Um, I'm going to go up ahead over here and I'm going to show you all the, uh, this is the uh, Philco Predict uh, brochure that you would get when you'd come into the dealer to look at one of these TVs. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have two of them. And I, uh, this, as you saw on the other thing, I've got them nice and museum grade glass. Um, I had this one unfolded to show the full Predict the line. This is what, I, from all the research I've done, this is the sets that Philco sold with the actual Predict the badge and the Predict the style chassis. Um, and then as you can see, I've got, this one is what it would look like folded up. It got folded up real neat. Um, and it would fold out to the full page for the barber pole and the tandem. This is for the holiday. And then you can see um, you've got your baby grand sets here, your slant backs, uh, your Cambridge corner set, and then your full dress sets here. Um, and what's really neat is, it, I'm sure it won't show on this video, but if you look really close, you can see that there's dealer, there's pen. That the dealer wrote the original price on it for him for that one. Um, but yeah. So we'll continue to make our way. Another neat feature you might want to mention, Blake, is that all the full dress type sets or the more cabineted sets all have the pop-up tuner. Oh yeah, yeah Dan, so that turns it on and off. Dan, that's a that's a good note. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, a neat feature that 
Philco kind of toyed around with on their predict the line um, that all their oddball sets that weren't the exposed CRT um, or the floating CRT, um, they had the, that pop-up tuner where if you look, it pops up. And um, they kept this this for the, the model year 1960 as well. And you would, you would change your channel by flicking through up there. Whoops, sorry. So yeah, it, it was definitely something interesting. Just another form factor. I think one of the reasons I really kind of fell in love with Philco's predict the line and started to try to preserve all that I could from them is that they really were just toy. They were trying so hard to combat against color and, and just the pricing frenzy from RCA that they were just doing anything in the form factor arena. And you can just, you walk in this room and you just take a look, stroll around and you can just see that it's obvious. They were trying uh, to stay relevant. Right. Very true. Um, they, uh, if you look right here, you can see the next one on the line is going to be the, uh, the corner, uh, the Philco predict the corner set or Cambridge model, as they called it. Um, a couple of these sets, they sold into the 1960 year, as I feel they made probably a ton of them. And that's why you also hear that the 1960 sets were sold into the early 60s to eventual motel chains and what have you. Um, I'm sure they figured some sets were going to sell better than others, which is why some survived more than others as well. But at any rate, um, this one, I, I personally did my first predictor restoration on. Um, it's all there, but uh, as, as Dan can attest, uh, any good predictor restoration is a good fight afterwards to actually get it working. And I'm still knee deep in that. So I do not currently have a demo for that set, but the next two I do. So we'll, we'll continue on it. Just to comment too, what's really neat. I mean, they had full wood finish on these sets, real, real provincial, like regal styling. And it, it was definitely thinner than RCA's corner cabinet of the same era it was the thinnest that was their whole claim to fame if you look real close in the brochure they make a point to tell you that it beats everyone else's closeness corner so the next one we're going to go to is uh, my fully restored baby grand set uh, it's another one the master dan jones tackled for me i'm going to get this one on and every time he says that i hold my breath when he plugs it in and turns it on It seems like most of these sets were also uh, of the hot chassis variety, uh, like the Siesta is not. The Siesta was easy for me to add like a direct audio and a video input so I could go directly with a DVD player or a cable set top box. But a lot of the other, like the Holiday and the, and the pedestals um, and the 9L60, I think as well, is a, it's a, a hot chassis. So you, no. you couldn't do that without an isolation transformer. No, it's the 9L60 has a power transformer. and record Okay, it does. All right, I don't have a 9L60. I just got the other one. Yeah, I was going to say that the 9L60, what, that's what was so interesting about it was is that in so many different variety of sets, it, it did have its own transformer as opposed to the, the barber pole and the holiday. Um, and I think even the tandem being series string. Um, but this set works great. Um, Again, I was advised just for the sake of YouTube copyright, I'm not going to demo sound, but this one does work. It's and it's also in very good condition. No books holding up the stilts. <laughs> um, I just again want to comment on the form factor. I mean, this one's almost Art Deco-y. My shadow's kind of killing the, the stilts of the legs, but you can uh, you can see that it's just the design of it is just it's it's striking. All the sets I I would argue are very striking in their own right. Hard um, to come up with replacement speakers too. It's like a four by 10 or so kind of an oval that's there in that. Yeah. And we were thankful that the one in, in that particular set, the front firing speaker was in good shape. However, yep. the side firing speakers, I think mice got in there because the paper yeah. cones were completely chewed away and they even chewed through the voice coil wire. So fortunately those are I think they're like four inch round speakers are very easy to get. So we were fortunate to be able to get replacements from DigiKey and put them in there. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I, I was, I rescued this set, this particular set out of a, a shed in um, Southern Illinois from a good friend of mine that I met on the group. Um, this set cleaned up really well. I did, you wouldn't think after when you saw the picture of where I got it from, that it would have cleaned up this nice. Um, and again, we got really lucky. Dan was able to find replacement side speakers and the front one was the only one the mice didn't chew, but there was even a mouse nest in front of the CRT. It was a, definitely an operation, uh, but we'll, uh, yeah. So we're gonna, we'll go to the next one here. This is my tandem. This is just a standard tandem. Um, this one is restored. 
And one thing I do want to highlight that's really neat about this one is I did come across an actual tandem extension speaker on eBay. I got it for next to nothing and it works really good. So I'm going to break my sound rule and just show you guys that I have a working tandem extension sound speaker we set up. It's pretty neat. Now this set just got back to me from this one was restored by my awesome friend, Larry Whitlock. Um, Larry, just, just a, a shameless plug because I love the guy. He's one of the only members I know that sells turnkey predicta. Um, and that in and of itself is an art and a challenge. So I, I want to commend Larry for doing that for the community because it's awesome and he's a great guy. But at any rate, I'm going to demo this for you. Hopefully we won't have any eggs. <laughs> Blake, we were going to start a pool as to how many of those you could get going before you blew the circuit breaker to that room. I, I have my heater plugged in in my bedroom and it's a little like radiator heater. So I don't want to do more than two because I know it'll blow because I can't vacuum while it's plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> Our friend uh, Tim Poliniak is known for saying uh, that there are only two types of vintage televisions, uh, those that have failed and those that are currently in the process of failing. <laughs> yeah, and how. Sort of like all boats are sinking just at different rates. <laughs> Could I ask a question about the, the plastic on the floating CRTs? Sure. Um, I have one pedestal, one siesta, and three holidays. And they all basically, except they all basically have that same plastic floating CRT cover, but three of mine are fine. And the other two give off that awful plastic mold smell and start turning white in like, you know, once a week I have to wipe them down and they're, 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 they all look the same and they're all in the same room. So I don't understand why three are fine and two of them are doing this weird thing with the smell and the there's, white crud. There's speculation, <laughs> on, there's speculation on formulations Philco was using. I can only say that as far as my research has shown, Philco kind of at the end there, they were like almost not solvent the last couple of years. They were really running there. So they were running pretty shoestring and using what they had in-house. Um, they spent a lot of money, I think, developing that composite with Eastman. I could be incorrect. I know Dan knows a little bit about that too. Yeah, um, the... The, the tenite that they used for it, in which oddly enough, they still make tenite today. Eastman is still in business and they've since made corrections to the chemistry to combat the smell, the butyric acid when the plastic breaks down and hazing, things like that. So if you could mold new ones today out of tenite, they would last a lot longer. But, um, you know, the, there's been some speculation that there was a link between the green tint that they mixed in with that. Because if you look through a Predicta screen cover by itself, it's green. Yep. Um, to counteract the glare of the CRT. Uh, some people have noted that the deeper the green, the more resistant it seems to oxidation. I'm not sure why. I don't know what type of colorant was used. Um, so that's really just a guess. Um, is there, I mean, is there something you can do to seal them? I thought about like taking car wax or something, yeah. you know, like, you know, it retards the, the oxidation, but it will still happen. But yeah, uh, I find There's, that a headlight restoration kit works very well for cleaning those. And then if you put like a uh, car wax on it and buff it off, it'll at least help sort of seal it. Okay. So, so I've actually, I have something to contribute on, on this point. Um, although it would be impractical for something as large as a CRT face, um, this problem occurs quite frequently with smaller items like knobs, right. um, especially the clear plastic objects. You just one second. Exolite screwdrivers uh, were notorious for that too. The <laughs> old ones. I know that there's been also uh, there's been some talk that um like like tire sealant as well as um is here convertible sealant. So these are those clear plastic knobs. This is actually from a radio. And what I've discovered, these were just white, just absolutely white. And there's all these little nooks and crannies, very hard to clean by hand. Yep. The trick is you take these and you put them in an ultrasonic cleaner with nothing more than distilled water and detergent. You don't need any harsh chemicals at all. And you run it for several hours and you gotta be careful if there's you know, writing or whatnot, but if it's, if it's just the tenite, it doesn't seem to hurt the plastic in the slightest. 
and it all comes off like mm. down to bare plastic. It's really quite impressive. Um, but you, you gotta let it run. You know, even inside, I don't know if you can see that, but even like inside where the shaft went, they come clean. Um, and it's, you know, again, just a, a strong, you know, detergent and um, distilled water and an ultrasonic cleaner. So that would be my recommendation if, if possible. Um, well, as for keeping them from coming back, uh, your guess is as good as mine. I found that keeping them in a nice dry, low humidity area seems to help, but. One yeah. point or to your point, I should say, is that the, on the back side of the Predicta screen cover, it actually has a painted outer bezel. Mm -hmm. So that's what makes that kind of turquoise uh, border or, or frame around the actual CRT. So I don't know if that would take that off or not, but I've got some bro um, ones that are broken apart here that I could probably use as a guinea pig and try because I do have an ultrasonic cleaner so I could cut a chunk. I think you're muted there. if you're trying to say something, Adam. Oh, no, he's no. on. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could hear him. My son's name showing up here because he uses this for school. <laughs> yeah, no, I, again, just to, to kind of interject, I, I've heard that tire sealant and convertible top sealant are also things people are talking about. And I know, Dan, I think you mentioned that there was some type of a, a composite that, that might be viable for, with, for using to seal it potentially. I, I don't, without degrading the east, the, the butrate. I, I haven't had a chance to experiment with any, so that's right had, that, something I want to do. I've had some luck with Armorall uh, tire foam. It's pretty interesting stuff. I have no idea where the dirt, corrosion, whatever goes, uh, but if you spray it on and kind of wipe it off a little bit and then come back, it'll look awful for about an hour, and then come back after about an hour, things look a lot better. Uh, take that with a grain of salt, but it, it might work. We've got a whole well, bunch of predictors that, that sit there and turn white overnight while you're not watching. I don't know. I'll show you a, tire sealer uh, works. I'll show you a picture here real quick. I, you can um, see that it's just the design of it is just, it's it's striking. All the sets, I, I would argue, are very striking in their own right. Hard um, to come up with replacement speakers too. It's like a four by ten or so kind of an oval that's there in that yeah, and we were thankful that the one in, in that particular set, the front firing speaker was in good shape. However, yep. the side firing speakers, I think mice got in there because the paper yeah. cones were completely chewed away and they even chewed through the voice coil wire. So for anyway, I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I, I'm running too many computers here. I just wanted to show that computer keyboard, though. I cleared, I cleaned those tenite keys off with uh, nothing but my fingernail and an edge of a credit card. Uh, it took a couple of six packs of beer, but they came out, uh, they look like new afterwards. I did that technique before I figured out about the ultrasonic. <laughs> I I have an ultrasonic cleaner and I got absolutely nowhere with an ultrasonic cleaner. It did nothing. Did you, did you use detergent? I did not. That's the trick. It's an oil-based um, residue that's on there. I tried them in plain water and also in some, some um, ammonia-based clock cleaning material. Um, no difference. It, it has to be a detergent to um, emulsify the, uh, the mm. residue. Try it again. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you guys the, this audio demo, and then we'll get back on the tour here over to the other sets I got left, if that's OK. So it's kind of neat that that audio jack down at the bottom of the CRT base for the tandem puts out that uh, that audio um, that you can kind of use as an extension. I guess back in the day, you would argue if the set was back by your chair and the kids were sitting up close to it, they could listen to it that way too. Um, but again, it's just neat that it works. And there is like a little interesting system in there. Um, I can definitely tell I've been running the sets in here too because the room is about 15 degrees warmer already. <laughs> Um, as we make our way over to the other wing in the room, these are going to be the uh, Miss America sets that I have. Now, the one in the middle um, is the 24-inch Miss America set. Um, that one was their flagship set, the one that they had advertised as the five-speaker wraparound sound 
Um, it has the pop-up tuner, the 9L60 chassis, and then it also does have that 24-inch picture tube that you found only all, the only other set that I know of that was predicted that was 24 inches, the Baby Grand. Um, to the left and the right of that middle set, you're going to see that that's the 21-inch um, Miss America equivalent, the uh, step down. So it had the 21-inch CRT instead of the 24-inch. Um, it had three speaker wraparound sound instead of five, and it also had the pop-up tuner. Now, uh, none of these sets over here are currently restored. This one's going to be sent to the restoration guru um, actually a week from Monday. Um, and then the neat thing about these blondes is, is that one has the UHF and that one doesn't. So I was able to find neat examples of both, especially in blonde. They're uh, very rare. Um, and again, just a comment, you can kind of see throughout the, the stuff I have in here. I've got little audio accessories. And then this was a, a AM radio, a, a clock radio, and then another clock radio. They all sold alongside the 1959 uh, television line. They're all G models. So at any rate, we're going to go downstairs where the uh, tour is going to start to conclude. I got other people's TVs everywhere in my house. It's the problem with collecting, let me tell you. All right. So uh, a neat little piece that I just acquired is a 1958 Motorola early color set. Uh, original 21AX, uh, unrestored, but really, really, really clean. I'm starting to dip my toes into the uh, early color pool. So, oh no. <laughs> um, we're going to end the predicted tour on my 1960 uh, Miss America 21 inch set. Um, there's a specific reason why. Um, it's got a really neat feature that Philco is demoing um, right before they got bought by Ford. Show it to y'all. This set is restored and works really well. And again, to comment, I'm using a blonder tongue um, agile modulator for uh, channel five signal with an Oroku setup. Um, I have a a rabbit ear set up on this TV, but upstairs, as you could see, even farther away from the blonder tongue, you didn't need it. I had that, it's more redundant for looks than anything else. Um, but what's really cool about this TV is that it has Philco's Directa remote system. This is gonna be a direct knockoff on Space Command Zenith technology. And um, this has a working director motor and I do have the remote, so. There's a channel change feature. And then this other button is going to give you a mute feature, which is more or less just an audio dampen feature at that time. Um, and then if I hold it down, it'll turn it off. But um, I've had some luck sometimes where it will turn off and not turn back on. So I'm not going to demo that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that is the... 1960 Philco Predict Miss America 21 inch set. Um, and it's the only 1960 I've kept so far just because it has the direct uh, working remote system. Um, I know kind of cliche, but my ultimate goal um, with these sets is to hopefully open a Philco Predict museum slash foundation in Palm Springs, California, um, where I think something like this with this scene would just thrive. Um, and at any rate, um, I know everybody says they're going to open a museum, but um, I would only like to argue, uh, I don't know if anybody would think that you would get a Predict a collection like this in two years. So don't count me out until you see me, see what I can do. <laughs> and with that, um, I'll open the floor to questions. So I hope everyone enjoyed. I worked for Philco from uh, 1962 to sometime in 1963. Um, and I didn't work in the TV division. I worked in the transistor division where we made uh, germanium transistors, which I didn't realize it, but it was a dying art at the time. Uh, and it, they were labor intensive. Uh, but a band who worked with me had worked on a color display uh, system called the Apple Tube. It, it never worked very well, but uh, he said it was rotten to the core. But Philco was attempting to do a color display tube sometime in the 1950s. Um, I left Philco in 63. Ford bought them in 63. I came down to Texas, went to work for TI then with silicon transistors, which have lasted. 
Very interesting. I, I've 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 want I've been very keen to see if if Phil, what Philco was doing with early color because at the time it seemed like they were really just doubling down on black and white because they had spent so much money in that direction. Um, they also just to kind of comment on Philco's financial predicament. I did a little bit of research um, through some articles online and some of the balance sheets that Philco actually posted um, at the end of their years and stuff. They really leveraged hard on NASA contracts and everything. And truthfully, I, I, from my understanding, the only reason that they were really survived from Ford was because they had a mission control contract. Otherwise, Ford would have probably let them go completely under. Well, uh, I was they had a computer division, which may have been part of that. I was there when Ford bought them and uh, I worked in the Lansdale, Pennsylvania division. Uh, and I think they did have someplace else a computer division, which was doing some things that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, they were very big on surface barrier transistor technology, which made for faster computers. Well, these transistors were diffused, diffused, uh, uh, just regular diffused germanium, bipolar, bipolar germanium. Uh, they were very good for their time, very labor intensive. Each one had to be hand soldered and hand wired. So it, it was a dying art. Wow. But yeah, they were very reliant on defense contracts. Um, you look through their annual reports and half of it is about the stuff they're doing for defense or computer work. And, um, you know, they, they finally, sh I forget the year they shut down the computer division, but they just, they couldn't compete with IBM and they finally gave up. Right. I have a question. Um, you guys were talking about uh, getting some information about what the engineers thought at the time. Did they know they were building something that would have such uh, service problems or were they surprised or were they waiting for the bad news to come and sending out resumes? They, they really were. I think that they, that was almost set. They were primarily focused on if the, they, they were so internally concerned that the design was either going to be a huge acclaim or a big flop that I think that they didn't even really, th I, I, they were just, they, they could say internally that they were putting cutting edge stuff in the TV at the time. Now, cutting edge may have been too cutting edge, which is arguably why you have the heat issues with these sets, but that's what the, they were just trying to say, Hey, we're putting every last dollar of what we've done with R and D into this TV and we're designing it to look super striking. And they were betting real heavy on that design language. And uh, again, when, from what I've read internally, the talk wasn't about reliability. It was, do you think it's going to sell because it looks so different? And that may be a testament to Philco and their mismanagement, that it was more about how it looked and less about how it ran, you know? They certainly are striking looking. And although the technology in them is somewhat cheap, I guess. You could also look at it as very futuristic. The printed circuit boards, which came to be hated, and the couplets, really proto-ICs, if you will, screen printed circuits, were quite ahead of their uh, their time, at least in, in, in TVs. So I would, I would, I would, I'd buy that. I think that they were onto something. They really like from from what I've read. It, I mean, I, and I know that as far as the design language and stuff, you could say that some of it was cheap, but they were really banking on it being just this this like it was all of the future. I mean, granted, I, I think that that's all the cheapness is also a symptom of the fact that they were just over leveraged. If you look in the last three years of TVs before Ford bought them, there's so many similarities in knobs and things like that. They were just reusing things from different years for a while. I think it's a good tribute from David Sarnoff saying that the Predicta made television interesting again or something to that effect. Yeah, he is quoted as, as commenting something to that effect about the Predicta. Philco, after Ford bought them, had great success, though, with a whole line of cassette uh, audio players, cassette with FM AM tuner. They made a whole line of them that were really very, very nice and they were very saleable and were good, reliable products. I know that up until the 90s, a bunch of those Philco 
engineers were still surviving and held on to a lot of their internal drawings and what have you, because they were very proud of that work. Um, I, one of the gentlemen that I spoke with was the, the gentleman that interviewed a lot of those guys for the, the main piece of information for my video essay. And um, he has some scans of their original internal drawings of different TVs they had mocked up that they could have launched the side of. And they were really playing with some jets and stuff, let me tell you. <laughs> Well, and, and, and Blake, there was a couple that were actually in the catalogs at dealers that they never ended up putting into production. There was a couple that came really close. Yeah, we, we still haven't confirmed that that, that that one predictor that looks like it's got a continental head on top of a, a wooden metal planner body, like a room divider planner body. We can't confirm that that was ever made. I, I, there's no documentation. There's no SAMs. There's nothing like that. And from all all all, boy, all points show that it was something that they maybe announced but didn't come to fruition just because of the budget was, especially during the 1960 model year, which is when that was announced internally with the dealers. I, I think that their budget was just not there. I think that they were just praying they were going to make it the next day, day after day within that situation. Also, I think the uh, chassis would never fit in that slim body. Oops. So, Blake, are you moving to Palm Springs from Astabula? I would like to, yes. Um, I don't, I, I, as I've learned in life, even though I'm young, I've learned that you can't really rush anything good. So I don't, I want to just make sure I have my ducks in a row all the way through. Um, Palm Springs, fortunately, isn't quite as populated as LA and that greater area. It's on the other side of the mountains, so it's a little bit slower, which I really like as well. Um, but I, primarily the weather um, and the mountains and then just the design aesthetic uh, would be, I think, a big... They have, they have a, a mid-century modern... It used to be a week, and now it's like three weeks in February um, where they have people... They, they have hundreds of thousands of people that come out there now for that. Um, and I think if done properly, that could really be capitalized on, um, especially is, out on the West Coast. It's very underserved for stuff like this, I think. What is your pr career, your profession? Um, I'm, I'm in home health aid right now. I manage a couple of homes uh, for the state of Ohio of, of developmentally disabled uh, gentlemen. Aha. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I think that that, that travels pretty well. And the medical field travels pretty well. Um, Blake, thank you very much. That was very impressive. Um, thank you, Steve. I, uh, uh, you've done an amazing job in a short period of time of, um, of, of collecting stuff and having a, um, a bunch of it uh, restored, which is, um, as you know, very difficult. <laughs> yeah <laughs> dan, dan dan nervously laughing yeah i, I can see a 9l60 in my sleep so <laughs> predictor restoration is uh temporary at best right right if, well if you can go ahead shall we move on to um i think mike molnar wanted to talk about um his admiral color set um admiral or it's a zenith. Zenith, zenith, right? I knew it was one end of the alphabet or the other. Right. Um, so why don't we turn it over to um, Mike and uh, learn well, about the uh, zenith color set? Let's see. Soon we'll start capturing everything. Let's see. Is that picking me up? I need permission. Uh, you should be good. Uh, permission. Let's see, is that it? You're coming up. Let's see. No, it looks like you are... Sh there you go. There I am. Hmm. So, we ready to go? We see you. Yep. Okay. So uh, last month I mentioned the um, the Zenith 15 inch set that I often show to people, but it had a uh, color sync problem. 
So I decided it might be time to uh, dive in to find out what was going on with it. And I figured it's either now or wait for another pandemic. So I decided to go with now. And let's see if I can get the screen reversed here. I was very tempted um, to say that it's working perfectly now and it's T-Mobile that's causing what you see on the screen, but uh, the color sync problem isn't fixed, but it's such a neat set that I wanted to do a little starting tour of it. Um, the entire cabinet is built around a metal frame that you can take off in different sections. And then it's a two chassis set. There's a vertical chassis with a lot of the IFs and color circuitry, and then a power and horizontal chassis down on the, on the base with a uh, humongous power transformer. And um, like a lot of things, when I started on it, started finding I had more problems than I thought I was getting into. But this, um, this frame makes working on it pretty easy. The, there's even a place to put some uh, test equipment acts as a shelf on the other side there. And um, one of the first things that I found out was that where I thought most of this was restored, it was only partially restored. Nothing had been done at all on the, uh, on the color circuitry. And um, I've started putting in some of the replacement parts, but I haven't, haven't hit the right thing yet. The, uh, the diagram, since this wasn't a production set, I just have little bits and pieces and uh, I'm hoping that John Folsom can maybe get me some better stuff because I have to kind of hold these together and any voltages that were put in there uh, are illegible. Uh, there's also no waveforms or anything. But one of the first things I ran into, uh, and it must have been starting to happen while the set was still running, uh, was that <clears throat> the uh, 285 volt supply was down to 220. So I um, couldn't find a way I was going to try to relieve some load off of it and see if it came back. But I don't have any diagram that really shows much about what these different pinouts, there's a couple of umbilicals that come up uh, to this chassis and um, I couldn't trace it out. So I took the power supply rack out now, in this early stuff, uh, you can see they're using multiples of a number of tubes to get the amount of current uh, for the uh, low voltage supplies. We, we still there? Um, they use three 5U4s. Two of them are in parallel to do the 285 volt supply, and another one just does a 365 volt supply. So they all checked out okay, but eventually um, I added a capacitor onto one of the uh, sections in a can um, and that brought it right back up to 285, but unfortunately didn't solve my problem. Um, the other thing is you see they've doubled up on the 6CD6 uh, horizontal output transformers and they use a, a voltage multiplier section down there with uh, two 1B3s and a, uh, uh, I forget which tube is the uh, focus rectifier. So changing some tubes solved some uh, blooming problems I was having. The other thing they did that um, complicates things is the, um, the color is taken off after, from the second video and the contrast control is on the first video stage. So as you raise and lower the con contrast, the, uh, the amount of video shifts around. And um, so there were times I was looking for the signal and finding out I just had the contrast too low. All of a sudden you start to bring it up and, and things would pop in. But um, anyway, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes uh, to show this um, and try to report back next month when I've hopefully had some more progress with it. I've got a bunch of capacitors I have to buy and just going to go through and replace a lot of things. The um, other thing that this neat cabinet did is I found it in a, in a Zenith report. So where you see the bezel for the little 15 inch tube it was originally intended for their big, uh, I guess, 20, 21 or 23 inch tube. But otherwise, it's the same design. It's like the same cabinet all around. 
So anyway, I'll turn it back to you guys and hopefully I'll have something more to report uh, next month. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> That's really interesting. It's really neat to see that um, set in operation. Um, have you looked on, on, on our website? We have a document describing the technical design of that set. Do you have that? I have one thing that says it's the um, uh, instruction course that they were sending technicians to. That may be what this is. Um, okay. It's about 10 pages long. Anyway, I'll send you a link to it just in case you. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, John said he had some documentation too. I'm going to try him. Certainly, waveform would be great to have, and uh, and something where I could read the uh, the voltages and and not right. have to kind of various sheets right next to each other right. to see where the flow is. But uh, I've got uh, got high hopes that maybe next month uh, uh, we'll get this uh, in color again. Sounds great. All right. Um, any, I think we'll close the meeting, but I think last time people stayed on and talked for quite a while. Um, I got to get something to eat. I'm starving. So I will leave you all. And uh, the next meeting is February 27th, I believe. And we'll be posting information on it uh, fairly soon, I think. So Steve, thanks. if I could, um, yeah. I just want to mention quickly that if anyone really wants to see the gory details of what it's like to restore a 9L60, I did a YouTube series on Blake's um, full dress restoration. Um, I think it's six or seven parts to it. Um, but if you go into YouTube and search for Philco predict a full dress, the videos ought to pop up. Okay, can you send me a link to it and I'll, just, I'll post it on our site. Okay. And thanks again, everybody, to watch it. I really appreciate it. Hopefully, okay. y'all think I'm not quite as nutty now that yeah. And you probably <laughs> think I'm more nutty, but whatever. We, ne we never thought you were nutty. <laughs> I'm in like minded company, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in a house of nuts, everyone seems sane. Exactly right. <laughs> I was just going to say the same here, thing. Here, here, here. One of last count, it looks yeah. like there's over a hundred nuts paying attention to that. Yeah, and you're, you're, um, you're. The only difference is you're a younger nut. <laughs> we we grade on the curve. He's not, he's not as not as salty yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Good to see everybody. Okay, well, thank God there's some num younger nuts out there. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, bed. Okay. I enjoyed it. It was again very nice. Thanks for having me. Uh, you got about a hundred tonight, then all together, right? Chuck, have you ever seen? I, I spoke to you a long time ago when I first got into into predicta collecting. Um, I I um, have you ever seen any of these oddballs that I've that I've come across? Because I know that you've kind of had a lot of experience with predictas, especially in your younger days. Yeah. Uh, no. I haven't. I, I, I really never considered the Miss America line and the other lines as predictors so much, you know. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you, they have the badge. They have the badge. Oh. But anyhow, uh, uh, everything everybody says about them is true. Uh, <laughs> there is no solution. I want to also change all the tube sockets because those are also bad, too. So, yeah. No matter what you do, there's always something more to do on a predictor. <laughs> you're not you are not kidding dan <laughs> i agree with chuck 100 percent. i mean he was there when we did the the one in the museum the tandem and we had a synchronization issue that uh you know we had a bunch of us kind of crowded around it with voltmeters and so forth and Chuck spotted the lack of sync signal. There was a broken trace on the board that I missed when I had the board off. So luckily we were able to solder a jumper wire on the, along the top of the board neatly to get the signal from the cup plate to the tube. And that cleared it up. That happens a lot on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Blake sets had a few. I jumped it on the top of the board myself several times. <laughs> you do what you got to do. Yep. I'm going to check out and grab a bite to eat myself. Everyone have a good week and a good month. Take care, hey, John, John check yeah. your text messages. <laughs> Catch you next time. Thanks, Steve, for having this thing again. Uh, 
They're not as good as the live meetings, but they're certainly better than nothing. Here, here. Sure. Hey, Blake, are you still on there? Yes, I am. Uh, you mentioned Palm Springs, uh, and I, that's a wonderful, I have a business that's down in Palm Desert, which is okay. just a further, uh, maybe 10 miles down the freeway. Yeah. Yeah. Don't discount that because the, the property values are a little less expensive down in Palm Desert than they are in Palm Springs. And you're it's got, a, and go it's ahead, got go a lot of wide open space. Oh, you're, you're definitely right. I, um, I was just in Palm Springs for a week in uh, December. I went down there with my little camper and my, my golden retriever pup. And um, I crawled around down there in the thrift stores and what have you. And um, you're right. I, oh, uh, if I, I, I truthfully, I, 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 I could definitely, as long as I get myself within the vicinity, you're, I, you're definitely, that's not lost on me. I appreciate you telling me that. Right. Yeah. Cause uh, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful area. Uh, and uh, we service Palm Springs as well from Palm desert. And uh, uh, there's just a lot of less costly places in and around there that uh, are a lot better to operate from. I very much appreciate that. Thank you so much for the information. Hey, hey, don't forget about the Coachella Valley Festival down there when they finally get that back going again. <laughs> I'll that's tell you. A I wanna... That's a huge, uh, uh, you know, venue for uh, performance. Uh, a lot of major talent comes in for that. I, I know that a lot of people my age talk about that. That's a very, that's like almost like a social status thing. I um, right. I probably. I would probably never go unless I, I mean, the, the money is just, it's there. The tickets are insane now. Cause I almost went like three or four years ago with a friend and it was insane then. And they've gone up. I, um, I would definitely imagine though that you would, it would be great to be a business in that time when all those people are flocking to Coachella. Right. And they do, they, they come in the groves. I'm telling you, it's incredible. Right. I'm sure, especially so. for California and all that too, and all the surrounding Arizona, New Mexico, all that, all I'm sure. Right. Anyway, just want to offer that and good luck to you. And by the way, you're right. The medical uh, industry is very portable. I've got a colleague that he and his wife are both in the medical area and they uh, got into their uh, RV and just started traveling around the country. And what they do is they look forward to where there is a need for nursing or uh, those kinds of services, and they're able to work, you know, 13 weeks at a time, and then move on to another place. So it's it's amazing. I was very surprised at that. They need people so bad. It's not like other industries where if you can't stay, they get like the longevity thing bothers them. I my current employer know has known that I wanted to go west for a while, and they just want me as long as I'm willing to be in Ohio. You know what I mean? They, it's it's very uh, it can it's very hard to staff. It, and what's really wild is is for a lot not not to get crazy but for a lot of the, the economic downturn there it seems to be there's a lot of jobs in certain fields that are wide open too now granted i'll bite with some special with some specialty don't get me wrong you got to have some training but i it's, it's wild. all of us I, I i own an alarm company uh residential and commercial alarm business and all of a sudden this first month of uh, this quarter has just gone crazy with people calling in wanting new alarm systems. And I'm wondering where are they getting all the money? <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you. It's good. The business is good. for all you. Right. Good here, but hey, thank hey, good luck to you. Thank you. That was a great uh, presentation. I noticed thank, someone checking you. out in the UK because it was 3 a.m. in the morning over there. So it's nice to see we got someone from the UK watching tonight. Oh yeah, indeed. Good. We need we need young get... blood. We need young blood in this business. <laughs> I know. Well, I've I've invited people of younger blood who are slightly interested to come just to watch the thing, and uh, yeah. I think that is something that we need to do: is invite people who are not collectors yet, but could be, are interested in electronics at all, and um, and get them to come to watch this museum thing because they see how much big stuff there is there there's a lot of stuff out there and that's right the more we got to be careful though a one hour in-depth discussion about rare earth phosphors uh, might not be everyone's cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well as time goes on those things will certainly equalize 
and uh, there'll be more and more people who want to give presentations. And that's the key. If you got 10 people with presentations, then they're not going to be very long. Okay, good night, everybody, again. And that was the way I spent the rest of my birthday. So I had a great time. Good. Happy birthday, Charles. Thank you again, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday. My birthday is Monday, Charles. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> Have a good one. Hey, you too. Thanks. Okay. Night. Blake, this is Dave Arland. I just wanted to put in a good word for the club Philco Predicta on Facebook. That's where I met you. And that's uh, where I found out about this beautiful continental that's behind me. And I wanted to thank you for the, uh, the way that you've livened up that uh, uh, forum. And uh, also thank some others who are here on the call. Larry Whitlock, I see he's here. He restored the chassis that's in that set. Chris Rigotti, who does the, uh, the new couplets. Chris came to my house and helped me test this picture tube. So it's, it's really tremendous uh, to have so many people here. Ed Milborn is here. Ed uh, restored the first tandem uh, that I got. So uh, thanks so much for showing off your collection. Hey, thank you, Dave. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll tell you um, that, that, that predict the community has really developed to something special in multi multiple facets. I, um, I've met a lot of lifelong friends, uh, uh, Larry definitely being one of them. Uh, Larry's a, a rock star, man. Larry, Larry and Dan both, they, uh, they have the, the patience and the wherewithal to, to fight with these bad boys. And that's, if you're a technician on the end with these things, that's really what it comes down to. But um, I'm very thankful that Club Philco Predict has kind of developed into the system that it has because you even commented between Chris, Larry, and then even with Dan here on the call. Um, I, I, we have a very unique culture in that club where we're all just trying to help each other get as many of these things going as we can, almost just aiding and abetting the sickness, you know, no, no big deal, but we, we all love it. So I, uh, thank you very much for saying that Dave, that's awesome to hear. And, uh, that, that club is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> a story that I think everybody on this call will appreciate because we've all lived it. I have one of the full dress, uh, Walnut consoles like you do. And it was restored by Dave May, who has since passed, and he was part of our community. So I hauled that thing. Uh, well, I got it uh, for, I think, 20 bucks in New Jersey at some waste hauling place. It cost me several hundred dollars to get it to Indiana. I had to take it to Ohio to get it repaired. It uh, was at the early TV museum a couple of times in various conventions. And uh, I spent a lot for that set. It's kind of sentimental, but it was great to see yours, the two that you have uh, tonight. Thank, thanks, Dave. They, uh, my grandma had one in her basement. And um, my, my first memory of, of really black and white television is going down there and watching uh, either Andy Griffith or Red Skelton. And uh, the Red Skelton Variety Hour was just something she just got her kicks off of. And a very fond memory, very fond young memory is of my dad, me and her watching that with my family down there. So it's just something that survived really well in my, in my uh, psyche. So I, I guess I kind of latched onto it for uh, the sake of um, sentimentality and uh, uh, I'm, I'm the, the words losing me, but uh, nostalgia. Yeah. You know, thank you. Thank you, Al. Nostalgia. <laughs> it's a big part of this. Yeah. The nostalgia yep. factor did. That's really what, and again, I didn't, I didn't even buy a, I couldn't find the full dress. I was looking everywhere. I was looking everywhere and I, I'm like, okay, well, this is what I saw. I, I truthfully didn't know that Predicto was the ex exposed CRT equivalent little devil that everybody knows and loves it in the collecting community. For me, it was always the full dress. So when I saw it, it had different form factors. I'm like, holy crap, this is neat. I'll get a smaller one. And then I got that one and then that rabbit hole into the research. And then, then I couldn't find a full dress for anywhere. And then truthfully, the first one I found was actually, I found a blonde one that didn't have the swivel the the CRT was necked and the plastic CRT cover was gone. So it was just the body um, on the sidelines at ETF. Um, and I got that for, I think, $100 from Bob Dobush. Um, and um, I figured that if I never found another one, I'd eventually piece together parts from the swivel and pictures and what have you. But fortunately, after that, again, I got I got really lucky with Jerry Traub uh, feeling, I guess, sorry for me for my grandma's story. So he sold me his for what he got into it. And then um about three months after that mahogany one I found in Maine. Um, it was so funny. I, uh, a buddy of mine had sent it to me and uh, he said, look what just sold. And I was like, crap, because he knew I'd been looking for one. So I messaged the seller because I just, I figured I had to try. And I said, hey, 
is there any way that you or the person that bought this from you would sell this thing to me for twice what they paid for it? Because they had it for like 150 bucks. I said, I give them 300. And so they said, well, we're not, I'm, I'm thankful. The seller was honorable. He said, we're not going to, we're not going to shortchange anyone, but we'll contact the person that bought it from us because we did sell it. And if they'll sell it to you, you can come and get it. So fortunately, my silver tongue, after a few days of negotiating with the owner, I was able to get it for twice what he paid. And then two days later, I was in my uncle's Ford Transit Connect driving to the upper parts of Maine to go pick that bad boy up and bring it home. So uh, it's, it's funny how these things follow you. I, uh, yeah, I'm all, it's, I do more traveling for TVs than anything else. And I truthfully, I love it, but it's funny. That's the secret guys to getting a real comprehensive, good collection, travel anywhere, <laughs> be willing to travel anywhere on the drop of a dime. Making me feel guilty about my predictor sitting in my basement unrestored. Al, I know you have several. You bought one from me. You need to get it. Got <laughs> <laughs> them for years. I just can't. The rabbit hole seems too big for those sets. <laughs> Once Al, I go I, into them. If I could tackle the corner set myself, I listen. I, That's the first one I'm going to do, the corner set that I got from you. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. Although I'll tell you, I think honestly, you might be better off with, with the barber pole or the tandem. <laughs> They're all sitting there waiting. Mm -hmm. I have too many customer sets right now. That's the problem. I have like four customer sets I'm currently working on. Did you get that one done that you got that CRT from me for? And Blake. Yeah. Uh, no, not yet. That sets. I, I'm not sure what's up with that set. I got to figure it out. That set's got a lot of problems. Oh lordy. Yeah, that Blake. Did, did, I, did, did I did I tell you Blake about uh, about mine? I think I hold the record. I I actually spent a lot of money getting getting one uh, completely restored many years ago, uh, right down to getting the brass gold plated and just complete soup to nuts. And it came back and it ran for a little over 30 seconds. <laughs> and then it Dave, died. You did tell me that and I'm telling you, you need, to, you need to maybe bring it to the a convention and have Dan Jones just even poke at it. I, I'm sure that it, if it did something like that, it might be something that is relatively easy to trace. The, the, the only thing that wasn't changed, it wasn't changed out and it was the cup plates. So, so I've bought some from Chris uh, in the meantime, and, uh, I just got to get one of those round to its and put them in. <laughs> Usually the ones in the vertical section are beat up. Yeah, that's what happened. It lost vertical. So I am pretty the sure that's the predicted problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's um, that, that on barber pole that I, that I it was in the showcase. I had just days ago got from Dan. Dan had it working, showed it to me. And uh, I get it up here, and of course I get it locked into the TV, and it develops another vertical roll. I'm just like, oh. And that, Dan's always sent me phenomenal stuff, so I in no way fault him. I know it's just a, a predictive symptom, I'm sure. Yeah, and that one was not a set that I had fully restored. It was someone else that attempted to restore it and then gave up. You're right. Yeah, Dan, 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 Dan did that set. <laughs> it had no... Uh, high voltage in it and we found a torn board trace between the cathodes of the horizontal oscillator and that's what was causing it one side of the oscillator was running but the other wasn't so once we bridged that because yeah i hooked it up to my tv analyst and we got raster and video and everything so um you know once we fixed the board trace that solved the high voltage and raster issue then someone had taken a golden screwdriver to the if strip so once we got that repeaked, we got the sound back and everything, and it was working pretty good for a while. Um, and then it came back because we had more, there were more parts on the board that were original that were getting suspect. But there's still something funky going on in there. We got to figure out. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems that like anything with these sets, a good fight is part of the territory. Yep. Someone put it very well. They said, restoring a predicta isn't that hard. It's getting it, getting it to work is easy. Getting it to work right, that's where the trick is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like the problem a fellow who taught me a little bit about working on player pianos one time. He said, well, the, the job is actually simple. The hard part is you have to do it 88 times. <laughs> so everything's got its quirks.
All right, guys. Well, I I think I'm going to get off here and walk my puppy. She's starting to come over to me like she's got to she's got to do the dance outside. So I'm I'm hoping that I'm not missing anyone because I want to make sure that if anybody has any other comments, queries or anything on the predicta, I would love to hear it because I'm that's all I think about. I dream about it half the time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys can hear me, but uh, I um, I bought a, a Predicta and I've been listening to you guys. I've had it for about two years now and uh, I've collected the tubes and the parts and read up about the couplets and all these sorts of things. The other one question I got is uh, how hard is it to get a picture tube for that thing? If you, if that would be bad. <laughs> that's my uh, that's, that's one of the things I worry which, about. Which one do you have, a 17 inch or a 21? Um, the 21. Okay. The 21s were the less reliable of the two. Um, <clears throat> have you, have you looked inside the set and confirmed it does have the 21 EAP four, the original Philco, or did you maybe get lucky and someone put a 21 FDP four in it? Yeah. The FDP was what it was. There's a stamp on it that they changed the picture tube over. Okay. And uh, I've measured continuity through the filament. So I know that part's good. Um there should be a jumper across the last section of the filament dropper because that was the fact or the the chassis modification that had to be done to make that work because it was a six volt CRT versus two point three four or whatever that's yeah voltage. right. I have verified that's been done. That's as far as I've gotten. I I've, I've collected the uh, the resistors. I just thought I'd just start replacing resistors and capacitors um, and go through it that way to begin with. I um go ahead, Dan. Um, you know, I used to, you know, from past experience, if I'd say if you had a 21 FDP4, it was pretty much a slam dunk. It was probably going to be a good tube. However, two sets in a row that I have done, in fact, one of them was one of Blake's sets. It it was a 21 FDP4, and they were both GE CRTs. So I don't know if GE had something weird going on or what. The emission was good, but the cutoff was was wacky on them. A cutoff would go almost off the scale on both of these. They had the same symptom. They use a Sencor CR70 to test them. And they, you know, the picture was very dim. They had all kinds of weird problems with it. Um, but, you know, on the other side of the coin, while they were famous for being unreliable, I've come across at least three original uh, Philco OE tubes that still worked fine. They were bright. They were sharp. Um, you know, the sharpest well, the TVs well, of the day. Larry Whitlock also has uh, told uh, Larry. Larry's done a lot with Predicta over the years, even more so than most in the community. He's been and, doing it uh, longer than I've been alive, probably. <laughs> and uh, he's made comment that for the amount of C- twenty-one EAP fours, he's found good and or been able to rejuvenate with minimal effort from his Beltron. He's really under the assumption that the CRT wasn't necessarily what did Philco in in the Predicta end for reliability. It really was like just the heat retention and primitive parts in relation to what they were trying to accomplish. Okay. But um, at, at any rate, I uh, I would say that as far as your C- CRT is concerned, the odds are that if it's an FDP four, you probably got a good one. Um, if you don't. They can be tricky to find. Um, your your better bet, if you're looking for one, is to almost buy a part set and roll the dice. Um, just because I, I've seen Philco Predicta CRTs that are known good to go for uh, south of four hundred dollars a piece. <laughs> but okay. you might get lucky because a couple of years ago I bought a couple of compatible CRTs from the museum. They had some. Right. They do come across, and there are some equivalents. The FDP four is the one of the equivalents that that for the EAP4, Philco's original, um, the EVP4, I know I have in one of my sets, um, that's another equivalent. Um, I would just say as well too, I've also gotten some sets that were labeled that they had the 6.3 volt filament, but then they didn't. So just make sure you're really cautious that you don't cook a filament either in those sets, because okay. it seems like it seems like there was some, there was some flim flammery in regards to predictors. I, I don't think a lot of technicians liked them. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll have to do that. I, um, I've got the thing here and I keep admiring it. It looks a beautiful looking piece of art. And um, I've restored a number of Philco tube radios. That's what got me into this. In a way, I really, I have a shutter dial radio that I really love and uh, sounds great. 
from about 1938 or so. And I have a 1941 uh, Philco that uh, these are big console things and they, they work very, very well. And, and a few others as well. So this is my first forte into uh, TVs. Um, but then I hear <laughs> Philco's back when they made radios were really well made. Uh, I really enjoyed working on them. And then I see this thing to get it apart. You really got to take, it's not easy to get inside to get to the circuit boards and all that. So I really, um, I, I, it sort of set me back a little bit, but I will be getting at it. I've collected everything. I don't have any more excuses. I got all the schematics and, uh, I think really something I can need to do. I think some people can blow it out of proportion too. I mean, me yeah. never, I haven't restored a TV outside of that corner set that I'm currently working on. So I can't say I have a success under my belt, but as far as actually like physically getting underneath and working it, um, it, I mean, you don't, I, the first time I did the first board, I removed all the wires off the wire wraps and that took a while. That took a whole day of just labeling and unlabeling yep. and whatever to get that done. But realistically with a lot of these boards, and I'm sure Dan can attest, you can lift this, the ground sink points that hold the board on this, on the chassis and actually kind of do the work with most of the wire lugs on the board. You, you usually have to remove two or three in some circumstances, but most of the accessibility is there and it saves you a lot of time because the lion's share of time into that set of the headaches is going to be the wire wrapping of the, of the posts on the board is primitive yep. wire. Yep. Okay. Yeah, the, the sweet board you could flip up without having to disconnect any wires. So that was nice. Yeah. But um, you know, for the, we were talking about the difference in filament voltages in the tubes. Quick, funny story. The, the shop that I work at, the owner was telling me about a predictor that someone brought in. This was many, many years ago. And they said, yeah, it quit or it got really dim. I took it into a place. They got it brightened up and then it worked for maybe three days and then it quit. Mm. I don't get anything out of it now. And it turns out what they did was they had shorted off one of the filament droppers to boost the, the CRT voltage. So it's sort of a built-in brightener and they eventually just burned it out. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Well, well, I got to get at it. It's a challenge and I like challenges, but. Um, well, you got a whole community know, of people here who can give you help if you need it. So don't. Yeah, that's, that's really great. And I really appreciate, uh, I think I found your video uh, on YouTube. Are you Evan rude guy? The Evan rude dude. Yep. Evan rude dude. Yeah. Okay, well, that's that's a good thing too. I like to get uh, 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 versed in what's going on, so I will watch all those videos religiously, and I'll have to give it a start. I found a book on uh, Amazon too, uh, on demand on how to fix um, uh, predictors. But uh, after I bought it, it went out of print. <laughs> so oh, that was kind. Of, it was only on uh, Amazon for about uh, maybe two months. I don't know if you guys heard anything, know anything about it, but. Um, that's it, it was printed on demand. It came uh, with a publication date uh, a few days before I received it in the mail. <laughs> Somebody was um, selling those on eBay as well. And they were supposed to have a part two book, which was more in-depth troubleshooting, but I haven't seen it offered yet. So that's I right. It had a part two coming and it, yeah. Yeah. It come. <laughs> huh. Oh, well, I well there's, that's funny. <laughs> it is funny. I was really surprised the day or two publication date from the time I got it. Um, but anyway, so I got, there's a lot of good stuff out there and a lot of people interested in it. And uh, I'm going to have to check out your Facebook now too. Yeah, Join yeah. club predict. It's Cl club Phil co predict on Facebook and anybody else that's on the call, please feel free. I'm one of the admins. I'll make sure that I approve anybody. Um, we, we, we have a nice community over there. We, we, uh, we help each other whenever we find any quirks or anything like that. Dan, especially, he's really, really, really good about reporting any updates or quirks that he finds on these TVs to help kind of group source any errors or troubleshooting. Because I'll tell you, it, it, what's really wild and part of the reason why I had that, 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 those brochures and that literature framed, none of that stuff survived from Philco. Like, none of it. Like, they did not take any care in preserving any of it at all. They just, they must have figured that it, they, it would have, somebody else would have or something. I'm not really sure. But I mean, yeah to find th that dealer announcement brochure is the only thing I've ever come across like it. And I bought it from a private collector in Los Angeles for an arm and a leg. I don't even want to say out loud how much I paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
Well, Wilco prediction- probably just didn't care. I mean, I've worked for companies and they told me to put stuff in the dumpster and I put it in the trunk of my car, you know? Yeah, that's true. They just don't care. It's so wild. You would think for posterity, they'd want to, uh, whatever. Wild. You know, you're, there's a lot of stuff like that from Apollo era from uh, that NASA engineers have kept and hung on to. And it's just starting to come out. It's really interesting to see what they all have in their uh, back in their garages and stuff. It's uh, I, I understand that that I've seen that before. My my predictor I got at a uh, yeah. local uh, uh, antique mall, hundred bucks for that thing, and I and I did get some advertising with it too. Which so, uh, which model is it, Dave? It's the um, uh, the holiday. Nice. Yeah. With oh, the, with the, is that it behind your head there? Yeah. Oh, I see. I can see it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. You, you the chassis in that one's going to be different from the one that I did in the video, but it still gives you a rough idea what you're in for. You guys can see it. What do you know? Okay. <laughs> That's how far I gotten. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Not, not... The requisite question. Do you have the back for it? Oh, yeah. I got it all. Well, I got it all. Back. The back. <laughs> in, a, in a prior life, I would have lost all that stuff, but I don't lose that stuff anymore so much. But. I'll tell you too. I um, uh, uh, I don't. I don't know where you're located, but there are some guys that'll take on restoration work as well for these sets. If you ever decide you get disinterested or get hung up or anything like that, um, I, I mentioned one in particular, uh, Larry Whitlock. I, I mentioned him just because he actively advertises his uh, restoration work. Um, some of these other guys will do restoration work, but you kind of gotta. They they have day jobs, you know what I mean. Which God love them, they're they're still keeping the hobby alive and well. So you can be thankful. But with Larry, Larry's retired and a little bit older, so he can kind of his his hobby and his devotion right now is this stuff. So that's a, a blessing for the community at large as well too, because a lot of the time um, with parts and with resources um, that you couldn't normally find, there's a lot of parts like coils and things like that, or even some flybacks and stuff that uh, you might be able to get from Larry um, that you wouldn't be able to find on eBay or anything. And Larry is an, Larry is an active member of uh, Club Philco Predicta. So you can also, if, if, if anybody joins on there, they feel free to put any requests on the front page there. And I know Larry's good about replying if he has any availability for parts and or services. And sometimes even if you get through working on it and you still have problems, you know, we can help you out. Tim Poliniak had one, he had a holiday and he worked on it, couldn't get it to function right. And he got mad at it and sold it and said, okay, I'm never going to deal with this one again. Then the guy he sold it to a few years later offered to sell it back to him. And he thought, well, I've serviced a lot of TV since then. I've got more experience under my belt. I'm going to, I'm going to get revenge and I'm going to fix this darn thing. So he got it. And then two weeks later, I got an email from him. Hey, uh, would you mind getting this going for me? (laughs) And it turns out, you know, he did everything right on it, but he made a little mistake. One of the uh, filter caps, I don't know, he might have gotten a phone call or something. He got interrupted in it. He soldered it in, but the, the positive lead He didn't snip the excess length off and it was just barely touching the frame of the audio output transformer. So (laughs) that, that B plus supply was shorted out and that's why the resistor would always burn up. Cause he says, yeah, I tried it and smoke came out. What the heck? So (laughs) once you snip that wire off, replace the resistor, it worked beautifully. So, you know, it, it just, sometimes it's nice to just have another set of eyes looking at it. Cause yeah, you know, it's like help. proofreading a paper. You read it over and over and over again. You'll gloss over your mistakes. Someone else looks at it and they pick out five or six things. Yep. I understand that. Yeah. Patience and take your time. That's the big stuff. That's the big thing. Yeah. Yep. That's the big thing. Take your time. I appreciate the encouragement. <laughs> you can do it. If, no, if, if, you end up have, if you end up having a bad bulb on that thing, a lot of the replacement or the equivalent CRTs, you might run into some issues with the uh, the neck length being different. Yep. So yeah. the neck of the CRT might stick out the back, and then the back cover won't go on. Um, I have I have one. I have a uh, my tandem. I ended up uh, I ended up popping out the back, adding an extension on the back of the CRT housing, so I could get the get the longer neck in there. So it, it came out pretty well. 
Yeah, look at the tube data sheets and they'll give the overall measurements. So yeah. you can compare. Right, you can see if whatever whatever equivalent tube you're looking at to see if the neck's longer than the original. And some of the so, other versions, the grid wires are swapped too. So you got to be two careful. and three, two and three. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Yep. Uh, so there was uh, talk about um, rebuilding CRTs. Are they doing that at the museum at all? Would they rebuild something like this? I'm not sure what the, well, what's going on with the museum's efforts, right? The, the museum has the completely functional CRT rebuilding setup, but the, um, our efforts so far to, uh, to get somebody in there to do the work, to learn how to do the work and do it, and, and also to, to manage it, to run it as a nonprofit business, uh, there has been nobody available to do it. Um, the more likely scenario is that uh, Nick Williams, who is the only person right now who really knows how to use it, uh, is building a, a parallel setup, a, 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 another complete CRT rebuilding setup in his garage. He found one. And Nick, um, Nick was originally hoping to run the, the facility in Ohio, but he ended up living in Maryland. So it's, it's just too far away to work. So if he can finish his setup in Maryland, he will be doing um, CRT rebuilding there. Um, wow. he's, um, he hasn't retired yet. Uh, he works for the Navy, and uh, he was eligible to retire, I think, last year. And apparently, when you work for the Navy, they can tell you, oh, no, we changed our mind. We need yep. you. We're not letting you go. He tried <laughs> to retire, yeah. He tried to retire, yep. and, and apparently, he was too good at what he did. So that was a mistake. Um, so he's, uh, he's got another year or two to go before he can. Um, but he's been making you know, incremental progress, and he's doing some pretty, some pretty wild things. Like, he's... he's um, um, he's, he's trying to cobble together some sort of a, a, a homemade trailer trash version of an elect EDM machine. It, it, it's an electron beam erosion to, to cut apart the old guns yep. in the, uh, to rebuild the guns. Uh, he, he's doing some pretty amazing stuff. He's a, he's a, he's a heck of a guy, but it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a tall order. There's no, um, you know, it's it's not uh, rocket science to, to do the tube rebuilding, but getting all the pieces together to make it work is uh, something that, you know, that we at the museum and, and Nick uh, at the museum and at home had been working on for like over 10 years now. And it's uh, still, you know, just around the corner. And yeah. I mean, I've watched I've watched Nick, Nick try to build uh, rebuild several tubes at the museum. And it, it is an, I mean, it is a skill. I mean, it, it's it's really impressive to watch him. You know, cut a neck off and then you know reweld a, a, a new neck well, on. I mean, it's 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 really neat to watch. It's it's really cool. I hope he really. Gets it's it it's like anything else, Al. The um, there's a there's this um, ten thousand hour theory. Like you have to spend ten thousand hours to become really good at anything. Yep. And Nick Nick got a, a formal apprenticeship in a week or two from the guys over in France. I remember uh, and, watching and, those videos. And he's and he's he's done it. Uh, you know, in Hilliard, but. Um, there is at least as much art as there is science. So until, and he knows this, until he can do this regularly, it's hard. He, he, it was just so frustrating to see the glass crack every time he tried to do it. Yeah. And there were guys doing this in their, in their, um, you know, in a little, a little shed behind their TV rebuilding shop years ago. I watched a guy do it in, uh, over in, uh, in New Jersey here, there was a guy who was doing it and the guy was a complete idiot and he was rebuilding tubes with no problem. <laughs> yeah. It's, ama it's an amazing skill. <laughs> yeah. You would think just like blowing glass, though, it has to be an art. It has to be an art. Gentlemen, I got to sign off. So, yeah, same here. Uh, thank you, Blake. Yeah, for, uh, thank you, Dan. And, Great and seeing thank, everybody. Thank you, thank Blake. You guys. Thank you for sharing your, uh, thank you for th sharing your, your uh, collection and your passion and your time with us tonight. This was really great. It, it was. It, it, that I... Uh, I, I hope I everyone has uh, gotten everything. If they have any questions or anything, please feel free. Uh, my email was mentioned at the end of that video. I have a little YouTube channel that I have just devoted to my TV stuff. Um, it's not. I'm not a super technical guy. I'm trying, and I'm going to continue to try because I have a genuine passion and interest in it. But um, that's not necessarily 100% how my brain's fully wired currently. So a lot of my videos are more about the just the the factual, the historic, and then the acquisition part. Um, yep. But I, I, I feel free if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me and check that out. Um, 
I really appreciate it. I've already gotten some private messages encouraging me about the uh, my little uh, museum and foundation at Palm Springs. So very thankful for all of that. I really appreciate everyone. Yeah, I, I, I like your passion. I really enjoy seeing seeing people like you uh, and showing off their stuff. I have a passion for my 59 Rambler, so uh, <laughs> I appreciate it a lot. And I, I appreciate all your guys' encouragement. So I hope to see more of you guys. All right. hey, hey, Dan, the- before you before you sign off, I have a quick question for you. Sure. Um, what's with that jumper? I'm not familiar with that. Is that in is that in a, a series string or how, how does that work? Yeah, it's a series string set. So there's a three section filament dropper. Um, I think it's like 17 ohm, 15 ohm and eight ohm. It's a big sand resistor that's on the bottom. Yeah, it's probably a good four inches long. And um, oh. <laughs> the last section is the eight ohm section and they would have you put a jumper across that to negate it. So that way it brought the overall filament string voltage up to yeah. make up the three volt difference in the CRT. Now, but does it, doesn't that filament string voltage get divided among all the, the filaments in the string? I don't see how that impacts the CRT only. That's the part I didn't get. That's, yeah. I'm an electrical engineer, so I can't speak to the finer points. I got to go back and look at the schematic. I never looked at that. It's that doesn't like, make any like sense. Christmas lights, you pull one tube, all they all go out. They're not split like some of the Motorola's where or like the pilot TV, all the current goes through the CRT and then it splits into two separate halves. So that's one reason why the, the filaments always burned out because the CRT was the first thing to take that inrush and it took all of it, not half. Okay, it. that makes sense. So, um, and plus the TV diode has, over it. <laughs> it's got the, um, the yeah. was in there too for the soft start. Yep. So, um, and there's modern equivalents that you can buy on DigiKey for those. But you know, one port, point I wanted to mention was that even though back in the day, you know, line voltage was 115, 117 volts, now you're up to 120. That's a three volt difference. You can leave that filament dropper in there and it'll, with the increase in the line voltage, it makes up for that difference. So, mm. you know, have you ever played around with using a TVS diode like Daryl Hawk said to do in the, uh, in the um, pilot TVs? No. I have one in mine. Yeah, I mean, I've got a TVS in my uh, my pilot, but again, the way the, the the filament string is wired in this, it's not the same situation where there's a very high surge current and then it settles down as the tubes warm up. You need the TVS diode to shut off that that extra voltage that the tube sees. There's a great piece. I think it was, I think it was linked off of the ETF website or somewhere out on the internet where the guy, he really did a long piece on the pilot and how the different circuits work in that. And he explains, he has a oscilloscope curve showing the rise and the voltage and all that. And then the before and after, before the TBS diode and afterwards. But, um, you know, that didn't have a soft start like the Predicta does. I've never seen a Predicta tube where the filament was burned out. Mm. Uh, it's always low cathode emission. But, you know, I, I've only, I only have a cross section, maybe 10 or 12 sets I've worked on. So that's a small sample size. Um, you know, Larry might have other opinions because mm. he's seen a lot more of these, but. Does anybody put a separate filament transformer in for those? Yep. I've seen that done. In fact, the very first predict I restored, somebody put a 21 FTP4 in there and they wired in a little 6.3 volt um, filament supply transformer. Mm-hmm. And then put a wire wound resistor in the in the series string to make up for the load of the CRT. No, a lot of people do that with the pilot too. Yep. yep. My cat's trying to <laughs> come in here. Okay. Thanks. All right. All right. I'm going to yeah, sign man. off, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Dave, thanks again, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you for everything you do. I appreciate it. I very yeah, much. Thanks, so. thanks for organizing these, Dave. It's awesome. You go yeah. above and beyond, Dave. It's not right. It's not lost thank on you. me. It's uh, what somebody used to say. It's the next best thing to be in there. We got to get back to Ohio, though. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> You're damn right. Yep. I'm, I'm, not right. Too far. <laughs> I'm a little closer than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my commute is a lot better tonight. That's the only thing that was really good about it.
<laughs> and out. All right. Okay. See you guys.